This is Jocko Podcast number 182. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The insertion was flawless. We were in the wood line and on our way for a general area reconnaissance. This time, we played it by the book, moving 10 minutes, then waiting 10 minutes. As we moved, I swore that I'd never run an eight-man team again. It's too cumbersome. In this target, the vegetation still made me a tad on edge, as it had a second canopy in some areas, but still gave us long lines of sight, something we weren't used to. As darkness approached, we looked for a good spot to RON. With the flat terrain, finding a good RON became really dicey. Ordinarily, we'd look for high ground, dense vegetation, or an area far from any trail. Finally, we found one, and Sal set up a perimeter, set up the watch rotation, and oversaw the placement of extra Claymore mines. In one area where the vegetation was thin, Bubba placed a couple of toe poppers in the ground. I couldn't sleep. The flat terrain played on my mind. Before first light, the entire team was awake, alert, retrieving the Claymore mines and preparing for our move out of the RON. After a night on the jungle floor, I wanted an R&R anywhere with firm beds, clean sheets, and cold drinks. Because I insisted on carrying the PRC-25, there was little room in my backpack except for essentials. At night, when I slept on the ground, I did so without an air mattress or hammock. The sole item of comfort was an army issue pullover sweater that buttoned up to the neck. Whenever I put it on at night, I was always worried about Charlie hitting us when I was pulling the sweater over my head. It was one of the few creature comforts I allowed myself or had room for in my rucksack. Shortly after first light, the Green Hornet CNC aircraft flew into the edge of our AO for a routine combo check. I gave him a quick team OK and prepared to move the team out of the RON. However, the CNC crew told me to wrap up the mission. There was another problem that he couldn't discuss on an open frequency. We knew the NVA monitored SOG FM radio transmissions and had radio direction finding equipment. The CNC pilot told us to find an LZ and let and to let him know when we'd be ready for extraction. A few minutes later, the Green Hornets roared into the new LZ, picked us up, and returned us to base. The reason we were yanked from the field this time stemmed from a tragedy in the Prairie Friar area of operations on 30 November. An H-34 King B was shot out of the sky during an eldest son operation. Seven Green Berets from FOB-1 and FOB-4 were killed when an anti-aircraft round struck the Sikorsky chopper and ignited the ammunition on the aircraft, killing everyone on board. One of the men killed in that ill-fated King B was Staff Sergeant Arthur E. Bader. I liked Bader. On my last night at FOB 1 before shipping out to FOB 6, I played in a poker game where he won a lot of money. The longer we played, the more money Bader won. The more money Bader won, the more morose he became. At one point, I asked him what was wrong. He was winning, and he was ahead several hundred dollars, but kept complaining that he'd never spend the money. His response was that he had a premonition that he was going to die, and that men about to die often win a lot of money, money that they would never spend. We all tried to josh him out of his dark mood, but failed. Bader was a unique Special Forces Green Beret. He had earned and lost three separate fortunes in between three terms in the service. He was in his 30s but still enjoyed SF, spoke fluent German and a few other languages, and merely wanted to accomplish any mission assigned to him. On the, flight, on the long flight back to Fubai, I kept hearing him talk to us at the poker table that last night. Now, he was gone. Now he was gone, and that is the reality of war captured in the best-selling book, Across the Fence. 
and back with us again to talk about war is the author of that book and of another book called On the Ground and of a series of books called The Sog Chronicles, a man who has seen more than most and who has had more close calls than any man should have, John Stryker Meyer. And if you haven't listened to podcast 180 and 181 yet, go back and listen to them first to hear the background of this hero, this warrior, special forces soldier and leader of RT Idaho, a recon team for MACV SOG working missions across the border from Vietnam into Laos and Cambodia. John? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thanks for coming back again. Glad to be back. Every time you walk out of the studio, about 10 minutes later, I said you would text, say, hey, can you come back again next week? (laughs) We just have so much fun, I can't say no. That's happened. That's that that happened. That's both. That's how you ended up here again. Every time you walk out of here, I go, I want to hear you talk more, (laughs) hear more about what you've done. And yeah, no, it's uh, it's been awesome. And the response from people have been hitting me up. They've been uh, just just enthralled with what you've been talking about and hearing hearing you tell these stories has been has been interesting and you, you haven't seen this have you heard of a, a movie character named jason Bourne? <laughs> have you heard of this guy yeah okay yeah so i posted a picture of you when you were 21 or 20 right. i think you were 22 he's my illegitimate son yeah they, they, they you, you got some definite comments about that <laughs> interesting so yeah, we got the the real guy back again. So I know we that that first excerpt that I just read was from Across the Fence, and I wanted to go back to your other book for a little bit, the book on the ground, and then I just want to I got a bunch of things I want to just ask you about and talk to you about, but I wanted to cover one more section of this book on the ground. I was reading through it again yesterday, and it's just again one of these situations where <sighs> i don't know how you're here right now to be honest with you <laughs> only by the grace of god indeed the indeed. recon guides the smile on our team and you know I, 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 you guys had more than 100 percent casualty rate correct you had guys that you had some guys that had seven eight nine purple hearts bob howard was put in for 11 he only received eight in my case, I've been put in for two more, but it's just shrapnel. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at guys that get their legs blown mm-hmm. off, arms blown off, it's like almost embarrassed to take it. Yeah. And and anybody got a Purple Heart in our day, you got really ragged for it. You know, because like, <laughs> you dumbass, you just couldn't get out of the way fast enough, so you got a Purple Heart. Yeah. I think and, uh, we had his, uh, one of my old Vietnam SEAL buddies, I think he called it the v- the Viet Cong Achievement Medal was the Purple Heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> uh, so you were put in for two more? How many did you get already? I just had one. Okay. And again, Spider Parks and, and Pat Watkins, my, you know, my gurus, my recon gurus. Uh, we had one that had been put in for just minor shrapnel. The paperwork disappeared. Mm-hmm. Another one. Had more shrapnel, and this time it was a little bit, a lot more serious, bleeding and scratching and stuff, a little blood, but nothing serious compared mm-hmm. to what guys for sure they really get hammered. He said, "No, put in for it. Someday you may have to go to the VA, right? And if there's VA, even though the benefits, it's there. Mm-hmm. You get home loans. Oh, okay. There might be a future <laughs> if we get through this. There might be a future someday. Had uh, t- 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 didn't at, you go home 22. in Vietnam after three Purple Hearts? Was that a rule? No." That's this, this not rumor. A, not in SOG. That might what about be just a normal, rumor. What about a normal soldier? I wouldn't know. Okay. I never spent any time in a regular unit. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bob Howard. He took his eight, and yeah. he should have had eleven. All the clusters. I guess they ran out of clusters for those. Yeah, and you talk about in SOG Chronicles Volume One. What was it? Uh, Sixteen guys went out. Sixteen Special Forces soldiers went out, and they got thirty-three Purple Hearts in four days. Oh yeah, and probably could have gotten more. Sure. Ridiculous. Absolutely. It's, it's crazy, yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going back to on the ground. Here we go. The Hueys lifted off, made a gentle lazy turn, and pointed their noses northwest. Once everyone was settled, I allowed my mind to wander as I looked out and marveled at how beautiful the landscape was from several thousand feet up in the air, up where it was open and cool rather than closed in and muggy. There was also a sense of inner peace and pride 
This is what I had volunteered and trained so hard for. This chance to run top secret missions behind enemy lines, dangerous missions that made a difference. Like most special forces types, I couldn't stomach the monotonous routines of camp life, the ash and trash detail stuff, the petty rules, regulations, formations, and egos. More amazing yet, here I was at the ripe old age of 22, sporting the exalted rank of E4 and the 1-0 of a SOG recon team. 22 years old. (laughs) (laughs) Young and dumb. (laughs) Yeah, 22 years old, and you had been busted. If you hadn't been, you got busted down once or twice? Only once. Okay, so you would have been an E5, you think, at this point? I would have been up. Most of powerful, yes, at least in E5. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been cr- crazy. Because usually you got promoted based on, uh, if you're running missions, whenever the appropriate time frame was to be in one grade before you'd be considered for the next. SOG was really good about getting the promotions, at least our people were. So as soon as you'd get, accomplish your time in rank, Don't you'd... forget, I went from E Deuce to E4 really quick. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> When you, this, this idea of being an SF and just being on camp and on base and having the, the normal kind of routines, you just couldn't stand that? No. You just would rather be out in the field? Oh, yeah, it just drives you nuts. <laughs> Check. All right, here we go. Back to the book. I had been with RT Idaho for seven months now. By dint of hard work, lots of mission experience, and simply having survived, I was now a team leader. At a moment's notice, I could have millions and millions of dollars worth of air support assets, some of them manned by majors and lieutenant colonels, all doing my bidding, all giving their courageous best to save my bacon. I'd come a long way since flunking out of college and doing a stint as a garbage collector in Yosemite National Park. My egotistical reveries were cut short when the door gunner on my side of the Huey decided to cut loose with a long burst of M60 machine gun fire right next to my ear. Fortunately, he was simply test firing it. You're, you know, we would get, I guess kind of similar, is we'd be driving to a target, right? Being in a Humvee. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the targets are an hour, sometimes two hours. You know, we did some long, long transits, but you would get time to sit there and think about stuff because well you're, you're you're sitting there being transported there's not too much you can do um you know you're scanning you're looking for but you're in a helicopter there's nothing to do but think really it was always amazing because it's just so beautiful i mean southeast asia from the air even when you went over a combat zone you see the bomb craters and you, but the jungle mm-hmm. it was just just be- beautiful country and then look you get under it you get into the underbelly of the jungle that's like, oh, it's, you know, it's another whole world. The starling contrast, you know? Yeah. And like you, if you're in the desert, it has its own beauty. Yeah. And it, it can be spellbinding. If you just watch it, you're like, wow, look at this. Then without realizing that somewhere, there's a little hole some guy can pop out of and hit you with an RPG or detonate. Yeah. In your case, those remote controls. Yeah. When, you're, when you roll over. Did you... It sounds like you recognize this. When you were doing these operations, you kind of knew that this was, I don't know, I I guess I'm going to use this word. You were lucky to be there. Oh, clearly. Because I 100%, when I was in Iraq, and I only did two deployments to Iraq, I 100% knew every day that I was there, I knew that this was, like my time. This is what I'd been, li- this is what I lived for. And I knew that. It wasn't like I look back and say, oh, I really wish I would have appreciated those days. No, when I was in them, I completely knew it and appreciated being there, like every single day. Yeah. And I, I it was a nice feeling personally to think that here we are with the best of the best and we're running the missions. And that's what we live for. It's okay. Now we're here. Let's go do this and um, just hope to get the mission done and just wish the damn trackers would leave you alone so you get the mission done. Go do the wiretap or snatch a POW, Mm -hmm. something like that. But, oh, yeah, it felt good. But, you know, it's like quiet professionals. You just don't talk about that much. Yeah. 
Going back to the book, as we approached the LZ, the team crowded the two doors of the helicopter. I was on the right, half standing on the skid. Sal was kneeling behind me, his hand on my shoulder, ready to follow me out the door. Next to him was Hep, my 1-1 John Bubba Shore, along with Falk, our point man, and Tuan, our grenadier, got ready to exit out the left side door. We all kept our eyes riveted on the looming jungle, scanning for any signs of movement in the tree line surrounding our LZ. The top of the triple canopy growth of trees, vines, and other vegetation was at least 100 feet off the jungle floor, and the opening into which we were descending reminded me of the mouth of a long, dark tunnel at the bottom of which resided things Alice never dreamed of when she tumbled into that (laughs) rabbit hole of hers. As we were swallowed up and the darkness increased, a cold chill ran down my spine. When you're going into these spots, so you had pre-identified this LZ prior to, is that correct? At that point, we were working with Covey at during the briefing, we would give out the official uh, LZs, you know, the primary, secondary, alternate, mm-hmm. and that would go to Saigon. Then we whisper in his ear, find something else, because we knew the system was, was corrupt. And then, so by find something else, you're basically just looking for a clearing of some kind that's right. in the within, general within vicinity. That, within that target, and usually it'd be somewhere else they go, and somewhere where Saigon, the leak there, wouldn't get the word back because we had that one target. We went in with the bomb. Mm-hmm. The LZ was literally wired, and the top secret ward, he had wire already with a 500-pounder. So uh, we were beginning to do that much more often then because we had good, great coveys. They knew what we needed. The, did, the Cav- did the Coveys fly the area of operations before you inserted? Like um, a day before or anything like that? Well, during the day up, they would at least fly over it, sure. Would they just take to, pictures or anything? No, no. Uh, usually they would just do a, a VR, visual reconnaissance, mm-hmm. and they would try to be subtle about it. Like in early 68, we always flew a visual reconnaissance prior to the mission. You know, the NVA is not stupid. Yep. If they see a bird dog flying over a target here, they figure, well, pretty soon we're going to get visitors. And sure enough, so that gave them time to get ready. So we basically cut out the VRs on our part. And then when Cubby go out, you know, a lot of those guys have been flying. They're more familiar with the Would AO. you do the VR with a helicopter? Oh, no, no. What would uh, you do with? Usually with um, South Vietnamese Air Force, they'd have a little uh, O-1, oh, okay. just like from World War II. <laughs> The one from the battle from the Bulls where Henry Fond is up there in the right seat. And the pilot's got this little cub, Piper Cub that's going yeah. 88 miles an hour, top speed downhill. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, and uh, so that would be most of our VRs. But then by Christmas, we pretty much cut that out. And that's just because they were, they that was given away. You know, we used to ride on logistics air and kind of move the logistics there a little bit to go over an area that we were going over. So no one would know that we were in there, that we were taking pictures, you know, like just logistics air, just a, 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 an aircraft flying somewhere. They'd go in a straight line. They wouldn't, they'd just veer off a little bit so we could see what we wanted to see. Sure. Yeah. And then also did the fake el- fake inserts. Um, sometimes they didn't have enough fuel to do a lot fake inserts, but they had a device called the Nightingale where they would go in, throw the nightingale off, and pull the uh, detonator on it, and it would sound like a firefight. <laughs> so that would have a lot of commotion, mm-hmm. and then they would jump up, go to a second LZ, and then put us in. Yeah. At down south, when we were with the uh, the Green Hornets. They they really had it cold because it was flat, down, up, down, up. So if the NVA were trying to guess which of the three or four touchdowns where we were, they were really busy. Got it. Going back to the book, as the chopper neared the jungle floor, Bubba and I executed our first standard operating procedure, which was checking the LZ for trip wires or booby traps while the rest of the team searched the surrounding jungle for any signs of trouble. After giving the all clear, the team was out the doors and on the ground before the skids firmly touched down. How long would you hover there and look at the LZ for? Oh, not long. Like a matter of 10 seconds, Just five like you seconds? Guys. It would go in, Got touch it. down, get out. Sure. Yeah, we used to just jump out, lay down. Like the the helicopter would just touch and take off. It, we would just jump out, lay down right there. We wouldn't move away from it. Just jump out and lay down. A modern day version of touch and go. Yeah, yeah. We quickly headed to the wood line and set up a provisional perimeter where we could wait and listen. 
When again we saw and heard nothing suspicious, we burrowed deeper into the jungle where it was both denser and darker. Like some furtive predatory animal, we were looking to hide ourselves. After 10 minutes of no threatening sounds or movements, I radioed Covey and gave him the message he had been waiting to hear, Team OK. He and others could take up breathing again, at least for the time being. The deeper we moved in, the deeper we moved, the darker and more claustrophobic things became. Moving through the foliage was an excruciatingly slow and painful process, with sweat stinging one's eyes, bugs crawling and feasting upon exposed skin, and visibility cut to mere feet. It could be also be disorienting, especially when the maps we were given were so useless. And here was RT Idaho, looking for fuel lines some bright-eyed Covey rider had spotted and directed airstrikes against. Intelligence reports said there was a second pipeline in this AO as well. Regardless of how many, any pipeline we found, we were going to destroy. And what were the map? Would you have 1 to 50 maps? Is that what you had? Yeah. 1 to 50,000? Right, but they would cut out from the big map. They would cut out like a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 square mm-hmm. so that if we were killed, they came across the map, there'd be no other intel on it except for that one target area that we were on the ground. Now, I've gone into Triple Canopy Jungle before with one. You ever have you seen a 1 to 24 map? They're basically more detailed. They're, yes. they're twice as detailed and right. they're pretty good, but 1 to 50s are not that accurate. No, I mean, we had that one target where they had forgotten a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're on a mountain, and we're getting ready to go down to go over, and we look at it, it's like, hey, they forgot one. <laughs> that really could st- stretch your mission out when you're in triple canopy. <sighs> claustrophobic. You use that word claustrophobic quite a bit in this section. Is this jungle just tight? Very. Yeah, because, again, sometimes you had to keep sight on the guy in front of you as you moved uh, because you just become separated so easily because of the dense vegetation. Of course, a lot of times um, our Vietnamese were shorter. They could get through it quicker. Well, we would be down on our knees, and I'd be, I wore out more pants crawling through the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I saw a picture. I was looking at the pictures in the books. I saw a picture of one of the indigenous. that some of those guys were really small. Oh, yeah. Really small. 98 pounds soaking wet, but 50 pounds of heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, going back to the book, but I had more immediate and pressing concerns. The adrenaline rush that always accompanied an insertion had pretty much worn off, and another characteristic sensation had begun to take its place. It was a feeling of familiarity and comfort combined with an eerie sense of foreboding. Both were a product of experience. I was comfortable because I was surrounded by extraordinary, well-trained, and fiercely devoted team that knew what it was doing. Yet we also had stepped in enough accidental shit and had encountered so many hostile enemy units that it was impossible to not feel serious anxiety. In fact, I figured that when I stopped being scared shitless, I would be on my way to buying the farm. Cockiness had cost more than one life. So you still, you get that little mixed feeling of comfort but fear and anxiety at the same time. Yes. You know, you, like the whole adrenaline of the, you know how it is. When yeah. you get inserted, you're just pumped. <laughs> and at some point, you get off, you get on the ground, settle Especially down. because you guys would hit so many times, you would, you would insert and immediately get contacted. A lot of times, yeah. So it, once you'd be <clears throat> amped up going in, and then when there's nothing there, that starts to fade. Yeah, then you finally get on the ground. It's like, oh, at last, we're on the ground. Now, let's get on with the mission, worry about the trackers, let's get moving. But let's also stay cognizant to keep our situational awareness tight. And that, you know, this is a, the, one of the reasons I highlighted this section is, you know, just this is something that, you know, what we talk about complacency all the time. I know there was a, one of the Marine Corps units we were with, uh, the 3 8 in Ramadi, they had, a, they had a sign, they had signs around their compound, complacency kills. Oh, and, yeah. For sure. But this idea of, and, you know, I also talk to young military guys, young SEALs that, you know, they're, they're scared of this. They're scared of that. It's like, I always tell them, good, you know, you should, you should be afraid. Because you, if you're afraid, you're going to prepare more. You're going to train harder. You're, gonna, you're not going to cut any corners. You're not going to get complacent. And that's the same thing that you're saying here is you'd seen 
cockiness cost people their lives because they think, oh, we can just get away with whatever. Yeah, if you're not scared, I'm scared of you. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. And then you have to overcome that, though, because you can't sure. let that get get control. And we were talking before we started recording, we were talking about a guy that was in a firefight, and there was one guy that didn't fire a shot, stayed curled up in a ball praying. Yeah. And that's when, that's when fear is not good, <laughs> not your friend. <laughs> Yeah, our guys wanted to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to balance that. You got to be. You got to have the fear. You got to feel it, but you got to deal with it. Correct. We had compasses, so we knew the general direction we were headed, which was to the northwest, away from the LZ. We had been working our way slowly through the underbrush for about an hour when suddenly we heard an explosion behind us. It had to have been the Claymore Bubba rig to go off if anyone tried to follow us off the LZ. Its detonation singled, signaled a profound change in the situation. The hunters were about to become the hunted. In the jungle, there are almost always animal noises of some kind, and these suddenly fell silent. In the quiet, we could hear some distressing sounds to the west, sounds that were not of a jungle kind, but those of men on the move. We were not alone. Welcome to the jungle, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. That, uh, how do you know that the claymores that you rigged weren't set off by some kind of monkey or whatever, some kind of animal? Um, Would you guys rig them a certain way that that was unlikely? The way, the way Bubba and, and the Frenchman later would do it, or, and Lynn, they would put it in an area where it would be easiest for the trackers to follow. Uh, and so you just based on human nature. You're going to go through the sick part. You're going to go where it's easier to travel. And uh, it could have been an animal. Yeah. But basically, it's an NVA animal. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the coincidence would be too much, and the chances are it's just NVA. Yeah. And if it is a monkey as opposed to an NVA, we're happy. We'll find that out within the next couple of hours. On the other hand, let's get ready. Yeah. And the, so the, when there was... When there was enemy moving in the jungle, the animals would stop making noises? It all depends how close they were. But yes, a lot of times. That's why the most important thing in the jungle was listening. Yeah. I mean, 10 and 10 sounds pretty extreme, but it really gives you time to hear what's going on. Yeah. Because a lot of times you can't see That's that the much. That's the best sense in the jungle. And like I said, I've, I've been in triple canopy and we've done patrolling in triple canopy. And, and you got hit by monkeys too, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah we, we had monkeys <laughs> freak us out. But um, that the sense, just so people can understand, you can only see in, in that thick jungle, sometimes you can only see five feet. Sure, five or 10 feet at the most. And so you patrol for 10 minutes and then you just stop and everyone is quiet and you listen to see if anyone's following you to see if there's any other movement out there. That's what you're doing. Sure, I mean, and it's so thick that if I'm behind a point man, or sometimes it would be the point man with Sal and myself. Well, I would never see the point man. I would just keep an eye on Sal, and the guy behind me would just be on my backpack. I, wouldn't, I couldn't tell you where the point man was, because I just followed Sal. Mm -hmm. The vegetation was that thick a lot of times. <sighs> And again, I'm depending on the Vietnamese because they know. They know that jungle better than me. How come the animals would stop making noise? Would the animals stop making noise when you would patrol? I would assume. But once we settle down, then things would come back to normal. Uh, so when you stop moving, then the sounds would escalate. And if they didn't, after 10 minutes, you go, the pucker factor tightens up to a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I immediately signaled. Falk, who is on point to head north. This would take us up a hill that dominated our right flank. The climb was pretty severe, which was good and bad news. While it made the going rough, it also meant we were gaining some genuine high ground, and high ground is the preferred position when it comes to defense. The steepness also meant the enemy would have to work as hard as we were. I couldn't tell how close the NVA trackers were or how many of them were headed our way, but I knew if push came to shove, I wanted to be looking down on them. Always take the high ground. Always. That's just military maxim. And you know, I I will actually say you take the moral high ground as well. 
<laughs> take the high I ground like or that. the high ground's going to take you. Amen. <laughs> When we reached the hilltop, just as dark clouds unleashed a torrent of rain. While Bubba and Sal began put, setting out a perimeter of claymores, I can't, contacted Covey and appraised him of the situation, namely that it didn't look good and that we might be calling for an immediate extraction before nightfall. Did you guys speak at all? Only, only minimal, because most of it would be hand signals. Just everything hand yeah. signals. Just Occasionally, like you'd have to... Whisper near. Yeah. But if we, could, if we just avoided it as much as we could. But something like this, just so people understand, something like this, you're on patrol, you're not saying anything. You head up the hill, you don't say anything. You get to perimeter, you give the perimeter signal, you don't say anything. Everyone knows what to do when you're in there. You could go days out in the field without talking. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because what the training is, and plus you got the visual with the person that you're signaling. Mm -hmm. Like in my case, if I'm behind, fuck the point man. I'm telling him what to do, and I'll turn around, tell the guy behind me, same signals, and then we go. Yep. While I was talking to Covey, Sal, who had moved north to set out his claymore, suddenly opened fire on full automatic, a sure sign we had visitors. This was immediately confirmed when heavy AK-47 fire ripped out of the jungle in response. In less than five seconds, the well-practiced sow had fired off all 18 rounds in his car 15, set off the claymores, and reloaded his weapon while falling back to join the rest of the team. <laughs> That's legit right there. Sal was making things happen. He was the man. Would you guys, you guys would be training these immediate action drills, mag changes, I mean, everything that we do, right? You guys oh, would yeah. drill that stuff. Just Every drill day. it and drill it and drill yeah, it. If we're in camp, we go down often. And just uh, particularly in the beginning, through June, my, my first couple of months, whenever, every day, hundreds of rounds. And when this happens, these guys are, the enemy is very close to you because you can at least know that they're there. They gotta be what, 15, 20, maybe 30 meters away? And in, in that case here, I, I forget how close, they weren't that far for, for Sal to, to blow his claymore and the car 15 and reload and do it one more time. Back to the book. Covey had heard the background shots and explosions, so he was not overly surprised when I stated the obvious. We had a prairie fire emergency in progress and we wanted out ASAP. The mission was over. The fuel lines would have to wait until another day. The focus now became saving our asses. And to this end, every air, sap, air asset within striking distance would immediately be vectored to our target area. The odds would soon turn, if not necessarily in our favor, very decidedly against the enemy. RT Idaho might not make it out alive but neither would the NVA. You guys had some serious confidence in that air power. Yeah, that was our lifeline. I mean, um, a major edge that we had, and whenever we could use it, we'd, we'd use it because um, it was only a matter of time before they would get more bodies there, and we had teams that had been overrun. Mm -hmm. And 67, 68, so we knew the potential for things to go really wrong. And that was one of the things that could neutralize the manpower when they had the enemy had so many troops. Did teams ever get overrun while they had air power? Oh, sure. Sadly, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They would just keep coming. There's several of the Medal of Honors recipients, uh, Fred Zabotowski, Robert Howard, SF, on missions and... They were directing air power, still just got overrun. That's all part of the horror of uh, being on the ground against a really determined foe. So even though you have confidence in your air power, you know there's limitations. And if things really go bad, that air power is not going to be able to save you. Correct. And it's, again, it's time, weather, and where are you in the jungle? And triple canopy, if you're in triple canopy, all you could do is maybe gun runs, and you're not even sure how effective it'll be, but at least you get their attention. <clears throat> Going back to the book. Call King Bees, call King Bees, Boku VC, Boku VC. It was clear Sal and I shared similar appraisal of our situation and the same thoughts about what needed to be done. The only hitch was how to pull it off, what with darkness approaching, a storm raging, and no helicopters anywhere near us. I didn't want to add to either Sal's or the team's angst, so I didn't share my misgivings. Instead, I gave Covey 
the direction and probable distance we'd move from the LZ and told him I was about to throw two yellow smoke grenades to Marco location. I threw two, hoping some of the smoke would somehow travel up through the thick vegetation and into the clear where Covey could see it. Covey had good and bad news. He thought he had our location, but he doubted seriously if he could get extraction helicopters to us before nightfall. Not good. Not good at all. We now had confirmed enemy north and south of us, and they were closing in. Sal frantically v- signaled Bubba to set off the, the south-facing claymores. When Bubba hesitated for a second, I could hear Sal hiss, Cockadow VC. How do you say that? Cockadow. Cockadow VC. Hey, it's Vietnamese for kill. Duma, uh, which is Vietnamese for mother. Motherfuckers. <laughs> As the claymores erupted, Sal pulled the pin on the fragmentation grenade and lobbed it into the boiling dust and smoke Even as even more enemy troops came up the slope. With my ears ringing from the blasts, I thought I heard additional movement to the east, but I couldn't be sure. Because the NVA had abandoned any pretense of stealth, I soon verified they were coming from that flank as well. And there were lots of them. As these unseen forces maneuvered in for the kill, the jungle took on its most terrifying and claustrophobic reality. Not a friendly place in the very best of circumstances. It was now about the worst place in the world to be. Again, that claustrophobic sense. Can you see, can you see the sky in this triple canopy? Uh, Depends, sometimes you can see it, like glimpses of it, Mm -hmm. or like there'd be a little opening. So he was able to see the smoke. Sometimes you'd pop a yellow smoke, which is bright, and it wouldn't even be able to get through. Everyone was cutting loose as fast as he could in an effort to suppress the enemy's fire and drive him back. Tuan had managed to th- find some narrow openings in the vegetation and was shooting rounds with his M79 grenade launcher. And suddenly the jungle went silent, as if someone had thrown a switch or hit, it, hit the mute button. The only sounds were the metallic clicks as both RT Idaho and the NVA locked fresh magazines into their weapons. The fight was far from over. In fact, the party was just getting started and we were simply changing records for the next dance with death. The jungle again erupted with deafening roar of gunfire. So that's sketchy. That's got to be a horrifying feeling. Boom. Goes quiet. Everyone dumps their mags. There's that moment of silence. And in that silence, all you hear is reload happening. Well, and you know, too, when, when that happens, how when your adrenaline's pumping, when you're here, your, your time frame has expanded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now instead of like you just read it, that's how quick it is. Bam, bam, you're in. But yeah. now under the <laughs> adrenaline, it feels like it's slowed down. You can feel the magazine coming out. You hear the click, click, click. Everybody else is ramming them in. Come on, boys, let's, let's come down on this first. And our guys won. Yeah. With all the noise, I had to shove the radio handset damn near inside my ear to hear what Covey was trying to tell me. The good news, bad news routine continued. The good news was that some of the yellow smoke had finally made its way to where Covey could see it. But the bad news was we were nowhere near the NLZ. He wanted to know if we could fight our way back to where we had been inserted. Negative. I yelled as fuck Bubba and Hep all opened up on some NVA who had managed to sneak up from the south. There were green tracers whizzing all around me. Covey would have to wait. And that's another good point because in this war, the enemy almost always had green tracers. Always. Okay. Yeah. For us, the enemy didn't always have green. They had red. In fact, most of the time, well, a lot of times they had red because they had. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So it was. They learned a lesson. Yeah. So it was, you know, they just, they got their ammo from all different sources. And so it wasn't just this, it wasn't just, hey, they're green and we're red. It was mostly red. Some green occasionally, but. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, After helping repel the attack, I got back on the radio to impress upon Covey the direness of our straits. But of course he already knew that. So in his calm voice, which could drive a one zero to murder, He said, we don't have a lot of time. No shit. (laughs) The only chance we have is about 100 meters north by northeast from your location. There's a small hole in the roof and we might be able to get strings down to you. 
He inquired if we had much activity to our north. It depended, I thought, on what you meant by much and activity. (laughs) (laughs) I reminded him that north was where the whole shooting match got started. And while while I thought we had pretty much taken that group of NVA out of action, I couldn't be sure. When I finished, he said, don't worry, I have a pair of A1Es on station and I'll have the leader make a gun run and then give and then have his wingmen follow with 500 pounders. Before I could say roger that, the first Sky Raider roared across our northern perimeter, his 20 millimeter cannons blazing away. As wood chips, dust, and debris filled the air, the members of RTI Idaho did not need to be told what to do. We kissed Mother Earth and pressed against her body for all we were worth. In the brief quiet that followed, I told Bubba to prepare some explosives just in case we needed to cut down trees at the extraction point. I told Sal we needed to head north as that was our only chance for escape. No one looked happy with this news, particularly not Sal, who had finished, who had seen firsthand what was waiting in that direction. About this time, the second Sky Raider appeared and released its load of 500 pound bombs. They were so close that the concussions bounced us like jumping beans. And this is all based on the yellow smoke that you had thrown five minutes ago or eight minutes ago. And right. They're looking at a massive, this is another thing that's hard to understand. It was hard for me to understand. I was, remember I was a radio man when I was a, a sure. young new guy and we were out in the desert and we were trying to call in helicopters to come pick us up. And it's me calling them in. It's not we, it's me. I'm sitting there on the radio trying to call in these helicopters. And I got my air panel out and we, we're in the desert. This isn't trip, this is the desert. And these helicopters can't see me. They're, they're, they're not far, they're not at altitude. They're probably 500 to 500 meters away. Are they doing nap of the earth or are they up they're, high? They're, they're looking for us. They're, they're kind of, they know we're in the general area and they're looking for us. And I'm sitting there with a signal panel, like trying to get their attention. And what you don't realize is that there's, you know, you, you're seeing this helicopter. It's so obvious. I mean, you, you'd think there's no possible way that they can't see you. You'd think there's no possible. You got a, a 16 man SEAL platoon out there. I'm waving around a piece of fluorescent orange. We're the only human beings in this desert and they can't see us. And now you're, and the reason they can't see us is because they're looking everywhere. They're yeah. looking, they're looking at whatever, however many square miles they like can see. Like looking into an ocean. Yeah, or they're a looking. At, yeah, they can see all this space. And so it takes them a while, you know. And finally, I get them to see. I think I popped this. I think I popped a smoke, and they didn't see the smoke. And then I popped another smoke. And so that, I can't imagine these guys are coming in hot, dropping bombs, based on where the not even him, but where the covey saw smoke five minutes ago. Yeah, we may have popped another smoke in there somewhere. And also, I, I know that I had talked to Covey. Okay. Here's our smoke north of us. And he knew they had we had a lot of activity north and south, and he forgot about maybe what we were getting from the east. But mm-hmm. if we're talking about trying to get to the north, that's why he, he came across the northern. So he knew basically where we were, and he came in. Of course, the 500 pounds were able to get through the jungle <sighs> and impact on the ground. And those things rocked you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's one of those, those happy pains. <laughs> uh, good times, I guess. Tilt. Mm. All right. With the A1E activity to occupy us, we had momentarily taken our attention away from our southern flank, and now a wave of NVA hit us from that direction. Everyone responded with automatic fire, and Bubba and I lobbed some grenades down the slope. I informed Covey of the attack and told him, that when I gave the word and the team moved to the north, I wanted more A1E runs to our south. In my heart of hearts, I also wanted more runs to the north, but we didn't have time for that. We had to get out while the getting was good. The next NVA wave could be the one to overrun us. As Bubba finished preparing explosives, Hep and I continued rolling grenades downhill toward the enemy. Sal and Fook covered Tuan with car 15 fire as he set up a claymore facing south and covered it with leaves. A little parting gift for our friends. The race was on. I gave Covey the word and behind us the 
the A1Es began bombing the shit out of whoever was back there. Falk angled back to the north. We passed the we passed bodies of dead NVA soldiers, but we didn't have time to stop and search them for papers or anything of an intelligence value. We had only one thought in mind, get out. It was something of a miracle that Falk and Sal actually located the spot Covey had found for us. When we finally looked up toward the hole itself, however, it appeared a long, long ways away. It was at least 100 feet or more, and the green tunnel leading to it was narrow and dangerous. As we were approaching, I had seen the tops of trees being whipped around by the gusting wind and knew this would complicate matters even more. This was not going to be an easy exit. So you guys are moving to this thing. You're looking up at the treetops, and you see there's like heavy wind. Because oh, yeah. that's just weather wind. Like it's, wet, it's windy out. And we had weather forecast saying there might be some problems with the weather. <laughs> and so here we are, it's dark, and I'm, I didn't tell the guys this. I mean, yeah. I knew that seeing those trees like that, this Stormy. was, yeah. And it was getting late, dark. I needed your nogs. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I wish you could have had them, bro. <laughs> that would have totally changed this whole scenario. Oh, yeah? Because the helicopter, because the aircraft, too. Sure. Because the aircraft would be, oh, yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you locked, and we'll just, we'll, you guys can just... You know, pitch a tent. Have a picnic take first. Your time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the NVA, this still, you know, the the big motto of the insurgents, right, is that they only fight when they want to, and they don't have to fight if they don't need to. And you don't imagine troops that don't have to fight just keep coming after you. Just keep you're you're laying waste to them, but they keep coming. That must be the value of capturing you all cross-border would be so high that they just must have had serious intent to try and capture. Well, Americans. yeah, and then, then too, you know, you had that propaganda they've been fed for all those years. They really believed it. They really believed that, like the French, we were there to occupy. What we're just there was combating communism. Mm. But they, didn't, they never heard any of that stuff. <clears throat> and they were dedicated. That's whew, absolutely, yes, sir. Back to the book. The NV had not given up. Its troops were hot on our tail, even though we had heard Twan's Claymore go off and had listened to the A1Es work them over. You had to hand it to the NVA soldiers. They were very tough and determined. I again contacted Covey and asked for some, asked for some tactical air command air support to our rear. And in a matter of minutes, bombs were falling and cannons were blasting away. I'm sure I was impressed with the service as the NVA were surprised by how quickly the ordnance had been delivered. They were learning a lesson the hard way. If a recon team wasn't wiped out in the first few minutes of the fight, the NVA would pay dearly for the mistake. But more than one NVA unit had experienced this firsthand. So that's kind of a, cre- a critical few minutes. As long as it, How long did it take for air to get on station usually? Well, it depended. Every, everywhere it's been several hours Ooh. to, in this case, uh, we were fortunate to make contact really early on with Covey, who fortunately had A1s mm-hmm. that were within a few minutes away. So there was some luck involved. Very much. I mean, we, we seldom had that kind of response in Laos. Did you ever pre-plan to have coverage at certain times? It would be a special mission, yeah, like the ones we put in the uh, sensors. You put them in. And you know you're going to be in the ground for two or three hours. You book the times, have the assets set, so when we have to go or something happens in between, bing, you didn't come in. But most of the time, were these were these aircraft necessarily briefed on the mission itself? So did, would they know coming in? Hey, this is the AO that they're working, or were these guys just coming in? They were just they were just random pilots. It would be both. They had specific A1 units in the Air Force uh, in that time frame that were specifically there for SOG missions and SAR, search and rescue up north for any downed pilots. So um, they were very much attuned to our people working with Contum and with us up north. Um, So they knew everything was in the Prairie Fire AO. Sometimes when you, like when we were in Echo 4, our first contact was with a fighter jet that heard the ERC-10 beeper and responded to that. So, and other missions, uh, another aircraft would hear it, and um, they would, if they had ordnance, 
then we had to, you know, get the mirror, get them located, <laughs> find us, and then bring in the ordinance. Well, he put the call out to get the Covey or the Hillsboro or Moonbeam to let them know they had a tactical emergency going on here. And you're doing all that on the radio while you're still fighting. Yeah, we had to, had to spend a few <laughs> rounds there. <laughs> Lighten the load. All right, Bubba, Sal, and Falk had been busy placing explosive charges on trees while Hep and Tuan set out claymores facing south. I couldn't help but shake my head in wonder at Hep. In a dark jungle with night approaching, he still had his ever-present sunglasses. We blew the charges around the trees and they were cut clean, but the dense jungle refused to let them fall. We had not succeeded in making the hole any bigger, so we just have to hope the rescue ships could manage to drop the ropes down to us and then pray the ropes were long enough. So you're trying to make that hole in the jungle a little bit bigger. Like what diameter is this hole that you're looking at? Oh. This is like 10 meters, is it? Not, not, you know, that's a good question. Maybe 20, 30 meters okay. at the most, but there's trees in it. Yeah. No, it's, at least it's a little <laughs> bit more open as opposed to just triple canopy enclosed where you're just completely, we could see skylight, you could literally see the sky. Mm-hmm. But, and then you try and blow some of the trees but they yeah. don't even fall down because there's too much jungle too many, vines and yeah, everything's too many trees. Around. Yes, exactly. So it doesn't even help. Didn't help. Good times. Add to the frustration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we tried to blow up some palm trees, or actually it was Leif. Leif's uh, platoon tried to blow up some palm trees that were obstructing their view in a Overwatch position. Right. And they blew up. They set they set so many charges on these palm trees. It was embarrassing. I they got, were launched. I, I got re- no. They weren't. They didn't budge. No. I got embarrassed. I'm, I'm sitting there telling the the battalion commander. He's saying, what? "I'm saying, hey, there's, sir, there's going to be another controlled debt, and boom, and then so there's going to be another controlled debt, and then boom, and then so there's going to be another controlled debt, and then boom." He said, "What are they doing?" I said, "They're trying to get rid of some palm trees. Don't worry about it." You know what, sir? We're just going to leave those palm trees. <laughs> yeah, the score right now is palm trees three, seal zero. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Uh, oh no! Yeah, those palm trees are hard, resilient, they're thick. <laughs> All right, back to the book. With the helicopters on their final approach, I threw out another smoke grenade to mark our location, and the rest of the team began firing at the NVA, who had again pressed in on us. We could barely make out make out their shadows, but they were definitely out there, as evidenced by the green tracer rounds flying towards us. Covey hadn't been able to see my smoke, so he asked for a pen flare. When I tried to fire it up through the trees, it struck a limb and bounced back. Being desperate, I told Covey I was gonna shoot three tracer rounds, red tracer rounds, up through the hole. And before he could scream no, I had pulled the trigger on my car 15. I immediately realized what a dangerous move it was as I saw him pass overhead. In case there was any doubt in my mind, Covey took the time to let me know in no uncertain (laughs) terms how stupid I was. I believe the expressions dumb ass and shit for brains came into play. (laughs) Loudly. <laughs> uh, so you're in this situation. He still took the time to call you shit for brains. Yeah. Even though you're about to die. <laughs> Priorities. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I was thinking, I, so I never fought in Afghanistan. I don't know what they had. I don't know if they saw a lot of more green tracers over there. I'll have to ask some of my buddies. I never really th- thought about that. Um, so that's a, the, was that just like the normal little pencil flare? Yes. The little trigger thing you click. Right. And Single it's almost round. like a 22 round that fires up its a tracer? Yes. Mm-hmm. Got it. It didn't penetrate through, so you decide you're just going to fire some <laughs> car rounds. But F- Follow they, my tracers. But they saw them, right? They did. Yeah. So, hey, <laughs> one for tilt. <laughs> <laughs> Just before the rescue choppers attempted to hover and drop the ropes, I told Covey I wanted the gunships that accompanied them to work over the area around us, particularly to the south. I wanted the NVA to be either dead, wounded, or with their heads buried in the ground when we tried to make our escape. The muskets, the men from the 176th Assault Helicopter Company immediately went to work with their 2.75-inch rockets and their Gatling-like Mini guns, multi barreled weapons that could pump 6,000 rounds of 7.62 a minute. As the last rocket hit and exploded behind us, the 1st 101st Airborne Division slick appeared over the hole in the jungle roof and dropped sandbags with ropes attached to them. The helicopter was so high up it looked like a toy, and even its powerful rotor wash couldn't reach us. 
I could tell he wasn't being buffeted by the wind, but he had somehow managed to hold steady over the opening. One of the sandbags attached to the rope had a strobe light attached to it, and we watched it bounce off the limbs as it fell toward us. You guys, I guess they hadn't invented the jungle penetrator yet. You know they had them, but not on UEs. Uh, okay. They had them on the HH3s and the Jolly Green a, Giants. Yes, yeah, for those of you that don't know, it's like a big metal, uh, yeah, jungle penetrator. It's a big metal kind of spear almost. Spear on the head. end of a steel cable that's it hooked just, to a crane. And it just drops down, and that weight, and it, it, it's well shaped, as opposed to just a random sandbag. It bounces. <laughs> <in the air>. <laughs> <laughs> and so this thing was hot. This thing must have been. Like 150 feet up? Yeah, they had the longest ropes in there. I was surprised they even got down to us. Back to the book. While we kept an eye on the ropes descending through the trees, the NVA mounted a desperate last charge towards us. Twan and Hep triggered their claymores, and the rest of us opened up with all we had. Somehow, in the midst of all the tumultuous activity, the four indige had managed to rig themselves a Swiss seat using the six-foot-long pieces of rope we carried just for that purpose. Bubba and I now tried to do the same, but it wasn't easy to wrap a rope around my waist, pass it between my legs, and then finish tying it off on the right hip while under fire. But we managed to do it while the indige held off the enemy and began to hook up for the lift out. Did you guys ever think about using... Some kind of pre-rigged, like sit harness or something. They they were developing those at the time. They upgraded. They had like the McGuire rig, mm-hmm. which is just basically a thick material that you could sit in and hook mm-hmm. in. And then later they came out with the rigs. Um, I can't think of name, but it was a uh, an outfit where you had your harness built mm-hmm. in. So yeah. you had your web gear with the harness. So when it, when it came down, you just, just hooked click in, in, click in, you're ready to go. Yeah. I'd be thinking about that invention a lot <laughs> when, yeah. when I when I, if I was you trying to tie a Swiss seat. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. We were getting low on ammunition, grenades, and claymores. If we didn't make it out, it was going to be a very long night. In fact, I wasn't sure we could, I wasn't sure if we could survive the night, no matter what kind of air support managed to reach us. It was now or never. Sal and Falk located three of the four ropes and had attached themselves to one of them using snap links. When I asked Covey if the chopper could lift us all out at once, he replied, no way, it's going to take two lifts. No way is exactly what I thought in return. There was no way we had enough time for two attempts. There was no way I was going to split the team. Either all six of us were going out together on four ropes or we were going to die together trying. Call it camaraderie or fear, but I was not going to leave anyone, myself included, on the ground for a minute longer than necessary. I had heard all the horror stories I needed to about what could result in, and I didn't want to be the subject of some gruesome tale around the bar at FOB1. I suddenly had a bright idea and asked Bubba if he still had the claymore with the white phosphorus grenade taped to its front. When he nodded yes, I told him to strap it as high as he could as high as he could reach on a nearby tree facing south. He gave me his best are you out of your fucking mind look because he knew at that proximity the back blast would kill us all when we set it off. So he hesitated and I had to order him to do it. Once he finished, the remaining two little people paired up and hooked themselves on to, into one of the ropes while Bubba and I each took one of the remaining two. I wanted to balance out the weight distribution by having me on one side of the helicopter and Bubba on the other, but it was impossible to tell for sure which ropes went where, so I took a wild guess and hoped for the best. Best. Using the barrel of my M79 to shield the flash from the NVA, I used a strobe light to signal the chopper to to begin lifting us out. Did the chopper have enough power? Would we be dragged through the trees? Would the NVA manage to shoot one or all of us out of our saddles? We were about to find out. As the ropes became taut, fire, gunfire erupted from the west. Sal, Falk, and I returned fire, but our bodies blocked the other's line of sight, so they watched in frustration. Because my rope was longer than the other three, I was the last to leave the ground. This also gave me the additional seconds I needed to reload my empty car 15 twice. 
Things were happening very fast, almost too fast, and my bright idea demanded perfect timing. As we started up, Bubba reached out and ignited the delay fuse on the the de- delay fuse on the last claymore, the one he'd fastened to the tree. With my feet dangling in the air, I fired around from my M79. Still gaining altitude, I then pulled the pins on two hand grenades and tossed them down onto the ground at about the same time the claymore went off. The back blast blew under us, but we could still feel its power and heat. The phosphorus was like a giant flashbulb going off. In that frozen instant of illumination, I could finally see the faces of my enemy. They were hurting, but still advancing. With its engine screaming, the Huey somehow came up with the power it needed. It was agonizingly slow going, and we had to push our way through some branches, but we were not being dragged through them. We were being lifted straight up. The NVA continued to fire at us, and I had the unsettling impression that tracer rounds were passing between my legs and a sensation that will give any man pause for thought. The team fired back on full automatic, and we threw the last of our grenades. Like two fiercely demented and determined beasts, the NVA and RT Idaho remain locked in battle to the bitter end. As we finally cleared the trees, I immediately called Covey and confessed our little deception. The team is out. The whole team is out, I screamed into the handset. We came out together. Do not send in a second helicopter. I repeat, no second chopper. The muskets rolled in and pulverized the ground we had just left. The A1Es were right behind them, and as the muffled explosion and light flashes reached me, I found myself feeling a little sorry for the NVA troops down there. They were valiant and dedicated soldiers. They would have, to, they would have been a credit, a credit to any army. Those left alive would no doubt have some stories to tell but I doubted they would ever admit that a six-man team had held them at bay for so long and then escaped their most determined efforts to wipe them out. As for RT Idaho, we were simply happy to be alive. Not something I would have bet on a short while earlier. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and we were just, I mean we were lucky too because of the. It was Wait, cold. you were more lucky than that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean we we used up a whole lot of luck on that one, but you know it was uh, we we're lucky because it, it was we were still relatively high, not like the big peaks and deeper into Laos, and so the helicopter was able to pull us out. If that had been in the middle of the day in with jungle heat mm. and the heat of the day. He never would have been able to lift six of us out. But we weighed all that. And I didn't listen to Cub. We just rolled the dice because it was so dark uh-huh. at that point. So, oh, yeah, the recon guide smiled on us one more time. So when you, when you, once you got pulled out, would they just look for a clearing somewhere to set down, get you guys in the helicopter for real? Is no, that- that's the part. That's the part. They just froze your balls off on the way home. <laughs> Because with the Swiss seat, you know how it is with, the, oh, yeah. with the rope, you just everything goes numb. Yeah, and so because it was dark, particularly, they wanted to make sure they wherever they put us down was going to be somewhere in South Vietnam. So we were in the air. I just forget how long, and they finally sat us down. But you can't walk. You just you lie to like a <laughs> cripple for a few unclip. minutes. Unclip. Yeah, unclip. You can't flip. <laughs> so, so they so they didn't really care about your comfort. No, and we and we didn't complain too much. But you, you go, you're all sweaty, yeah. and you know how it is. When five five minutes later, you're at five thousand feet, which is cold. People For forget sure. how cold it is at five thousand feet. Yeah, you're freezing. Yeah, especially because you're soaking wet. Yeah, and you feel like and you you're got, going eighty miles an hour. So you go, an yeah, eighty mile an hour wind. Yeah, all that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just. I mean, this just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And this was just over and over again. Now, um, you know, I spent a lot of time on the books on the last couple podcasts. I, I wanted to I wanted to kind of just ask you a couple questions, get your thoughts on some stuff. Um, and I also, and I don't know, you might have to come back again, but I got Sog Chronicles here. I read that. 
outstanding book, you know, and this is, uh, Sog Chronicles, uh, real quick, talks about a big operation that, that, w- t- that uh, took place that you weren't on, but you got really good descriptions and talked to people, Operation Tailwind. That's another one where helicopters are getting shot down. I mean, it's completely, completely insane. Yeah, and there's, and no, no ordinary helic. These are the CH fifty threes, Delta models. Yeah, the biggest the Marine Corps had, and they took out two of those, I and think, left one really banged up. Yeah, and when they inserted, they still they had th- three WIAs on their insertion, but they had to get in for that to take the pressure off of the CIA operation. Mm-hmm. That was their mission, September nineteen seventy. Yeah, th- that's so. That's Operation Tailwind. Operation Tailwind, and that that book, Sog Chronicles, Volume One, and I, I hope there's going to be about thirty more volumes of. We're going to be Chronicles. working on it. The model that <laughs> Ann and I came up with is that we're going to write till we die. I like it because there's so many Sog stories that have never been told yeah. because we couldn't tell, and so many of our guys. I mean, even when I, a fellow recon guy, talk to him, it's like pulling information. I'm sure you've run into that with your people. That they, yeah. they're not. They're not inclined to talk. Well, yeah, and, that, and you they're know, modest. That's, that's an interesting thing because people they're not the wannabes at the bar. Yeah, hey, yeah. Man, I'm a Green Beret or I'm a SEAL. And and most of the guys, when you know, people say, "Well, you, you should have more guys from TU Bruiser on there. Or you have to have more guys, more SEALs on." The SEALs that I know that I would want to have on, a lot of them, they're still in, yeah. or they don't want to come on. And they it's can't. Like, they well, won't say yeah, a word. Yeah, they're they're like, "Hey, you know, I'm good," you know. And then obviously, I got a lot of my friends that that do come on. And it's it's great when they come on, but yeah, a lot of guys are still doing it, you know. And so, hey, that's the way it is. Once those guys retire, and I do have some friends that are retiring soon, and they're becoming on, so that's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, but um, yeah. So the Sog Chronicles, uh, you you've like I said, hopefully there's thirty volumes of that. Right now there's just one. We're gonna try to turn across the fence and on the ground into audio books. Oh, that's awesome. That's our project right now. And then as soon as we're done with that, to commence uh, with volume two. And we, ha- we got a couple of stories there. Uh, well, the one that we talked about and on the ground, the August 23rd attack, we've had a lot more research. We had this gal who's a, she was an MI, and she has pulled out more information. We're going to pull the whole thing together for the, hopefully the most detailed story in that night because it was such a, tragic yet heroic night for yeah. the people that were there on the ground that night and Larry Trimble up on uh, Marble Mountain. Yeah. So we have that, a couple other stories, many other stories, but there's uh, the other one, one of our guys went in for a bright light and they got shot out. Uh, and they, uh, F4 crashed. As it was crashing, it hit three separate hilltops coming to rest on the third one. They got to the second hill and got shot out. He went back 25 years later. He became a doctor on his own money, spent $70,000 to go back to Cambodia hmm. to try to find that F4. It just gnawed at his conscience. Hmm. They got in, got to the site, and were run off by bandits. He went back, now it would be two years ago, with DPAA. And DPAA was working on the second hill where the jet was on the third hill, so he's able to go in to give them direct uh, sighting as to where to dig. So they're still working, and he was on the ground digging things out with these guys. So that's going to be in that book. Yeah. Yeah. So check out that book too, Sog Chronicles. Um, your training. How ready do you think you were when you got to Vietnam? How ready were you for what you were about to encounter? Well, a lot better than the guys that went through just basic training and advanced infantry training. And I'm sure that conventional units had in-country training. Our in-country training was was good. You worked, we, you know, we practiced calling in spooky, mm-hmm. worked with the helicopters, told about the dangers, and working with the little people, the history, as well as some of the do's and don'ts about working with South Vietnamese. And I thought that was good. But then traditional A camp duty, which is, I think all that was geared for the A camps, mm-hmm. SOG was just at another level. And that's why we always talked. So people like Pat Watkins, Spider Parks, John McGovern, um, Dick Gross, they were the senior E7s or E6s in camp, all of whom had run. At night, us green guys would talk to them. 
particularly after a mission. And then we talked to each other. You know, uh, John Walton came back from a target and uh, where uh, Tom Cunningham's leg was blown off, one of his little people that got shot four times, and Captain Tin, who saved us in October, pulled them out in August. And we talked right away that night. Well, what did you learn? Mm-hmm. And, and it would always be this back and forth to try to uh, get any sense of what happened or anything you could do to give us anything for another edge on the, in the field. And meanwhile, we're getting the intel reports. We knew about all the teams that had been wiped out. And the intel reports about the sappers. So you all balanced it out and just key thing was comma. So in answer to your question, SOG was so different. A lot of it was innovative. The things we were doing there were the strings. That was all things that you use today, really advanced mm-hmm. it. You know, no fast ropes. Mm-hmm. That was another dimension away, another war. So we're working that firepower, working with the air assets, um, and new weapons. But it was all like experimental things. You learn as you go, try to take what's best. And like Lynn Black, blow yourself up in, a, in, in an ambush <laughs> just for good luck to make sure it really works. <laughs> Did you, when you were calling for fire, so I don't know if you know this, but now it's like a school you go to. You you go to a joint tactical air controller school and that's sort of your specialty is calling for fire, calling right. for bombs. But you just, you trained in country to learn how to do it? Yes, and, and again, we talked to, that's where we talked to Spider and Pat Watkins specifically. And so that was the, that was more important than actually going out, popping the smoke and having the gun run. It was learning how to do it the right mm-hmm. way. Now, you're in a box, and you never have a gun run go across you. Mm-hmm. It'd be in front, you know, mm-hmm. your front to left, southeast, and you direct it that way. And how many inches, I mean, how many feet of yards from your perimeter, how many meters, and that applied when we got into the field because once we were up at Fubai, we didn't practice airstrikes. Once we were on the ground, we did it. But it did it with confidence, thanks to Spider, Watkins, and John McGovern particularly. They sat with us, our green guys at night and made us you know, understand that. And we had a couple cases where people made mistakes yeah. and teams got hit and lost people. They had a... Uh, they were bringing in some people. We were, our body count was so low that they were bringing in people from other units, and they would come in cocky. And uh, when once they got on the ground, they were just maybe a little too cocky and hadn't listened to all the lessons. And some of the teams would let the other people carry the radio. That's why I carried the radio. And we had one team, a young guy came in and called the airstrike on his own team. They came with a gun run right across the team's hmm. RON. And it's like that, you know, so, yeah, I, 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 that does not surprise me at all. I mean, when I, I'm listening to or reading your books, the fact that you guys were doing that, you obviously had a massive amount of skill to not have that happen. Because, like I said, these guys are looking at a jungle canopy. They, they're looking at some random bit of smoke that came out, and yet you're directing fire based on that. It's 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 awesome. But I could see where somebody could easily... You know, make a mistake. You know, you give the wrong direction. You, you know, you look at your compass is spinning the wrong way. You know, it's too close to your weapon. You got your cardinal directions. I mean, there's so many things that could go wrong. That and yet, and yet, you're just doing. I mean, there's times we're out there doing gun runs for for 12 hours straight. Long, long time. And 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 like your case where you had the um, the unit that you wanted to attack the building and you challenged it three times and the last time you called it off because it was another unit, yeah. another SEAL team. Well, we had that common sense thing on the ground too where we would direct it, but if there was something that wasn't quite right, you, you put everything on hold until you got it right. Yeah, that's it's weird because Leif and I wrote Extreme Ownership and we didn't really coordinate stories that we were talking about and yet there's multiple stories in there about either blue on blues or potential blue on blues because man in a city like that with all these different different units running around all on different radio frequencies oh yeah and a bunch of enemy mujahideen fighters running around in there too it was blue on blue was a very real thing and there would be probably one case of blue on blue a day that would happen and maybe one a week that would get reported you know, but just, and I'm not talking where someone wow, gets shot, really? but, but yeah. like, you know, just all of a sudden you're taking rounds and you're like, where are those coming from? 
oh, oh, that's another unit down there. And that's maybe an M4. That's yeah. an M4 A1 yeah. yeah. a- a- opening a- up a- on me. Oops. Exactly, exactly. So that, it would happen all the time. Um, and that's one thing that was nice about, well, for you, it, not nice, but it's less complicated. You're the only friendly guys out there. There was, oh, yeah. no, there was no friendly fire happening. You guys. You it's guys, us versus you, them. Yeah, the it's big all them. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you got mission taskings, mm-hmm. where'd they come from? Were they were they coming from up above? Were you guys developing targets yourself? Where where did that? How did that process? It was work? a happy mix of both. Um, the the chain of command for SOG went to SOG headquarters right to the White House. They had somebody from DOD that was there. Some I don't know some general somebody, but that was their mission was to keep an eye on SOG. So they would send missions from there that would come to headquarters to each FOB, and then our immediate action reports would all go back after action reports would go back through the chain of command. So they knew what was going on at the White House. There was somebody at the White House, that's where we were told. And on occasions, if we had a target that we wanted to do B-52 strike, that would go back through the chain of command and then get approval on it. But the, the from what the public knew, the public knew we were bombing. No, they didn't know anything about they Laos didn't, or they, Cambodia. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't even know we were bombing Laos and Cambodia? Correct. Nothing, there were no reporters in there. There's no communist news network back then. Um, so, and the communists would not talk about it because they had agreed to the agreement of not having their people there because they always said, hey, Laos and Cambodia, they're neutral. We respect them, yeah. lion dogs. And we said the same thing, but our, we just went in with our recon teams as opposed to them just going down and enslaving all the people that worked there work with us, help us open the roads. And, you know, if we saw indigenous people, we would not open fire on them. I mean, it's like, you're not going to go after the local people. They don't know any better. Just caught in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, but the NBA, they, they, they tell them, you work with us or you die. Yeah. Well, you, you know, in, in one of the books you were talking about how the, the NBA treated the, the indig people there so horribly that the indig troops that you worked with like, hated the NBA. Oh, they yeah. hated them. The, these NVA had raped their women and beat their wives and just done horrible things to them. So Absolutely. they were there for they were there to fight. Yep, and they uh, they cut nobody any slack. I mean, America today, particularly our snowflakes, don't know what the soldiers of communism were really like in the field, and they're just nasty people. And um, that's what we were fighting. Mm-hmm. And they were de- they were really dedicated, and their their sense of purpose because they've been so thoroughly indoctrinated. Mm-hmm. They really believe what they're doing, even though they're working off a uh, propaganda. Yeah. When you so the so you would come up with some of the missions, some of the missions would come down to you. Majority came. Majority came down to you. And of course, you know they would have. Sometimes I think there would be. We gotta get a team on the ground. That's why we were going in primary, secondary, all to get shot out, eat lunch, go back and try again. Cause they just wanted to get somebody on the ground. And that would just be your that's an automatic area reconnaissance. And that's because they had something they wanted to see, they some something like that. Sometimes our S three people would just want to get a team on the ground so they could report at headquarters that night. We have one or two teams on the ground. Wait, do you mean that they're just wanting to hey, look what we're doing? Yeah. Now, I'm sure the guys that were in S3 would deny that emphatically, but it felt like that. Yeah, yeah. Particularly when you came back and said, here's a new target, and they'll pick an LZ for you while you're flying back to the next target. Did you ever, what if you, what if there was a mission that you looked at and you said, hey, this is dumb. This doesn't make sense. Well, there's only one that I declined around about Christmas time of 68. I just had a feeling, and a team went in. I was worried, but they were on the ground for five days, and it was mm-hmm. a dry hole. And they came out without any shots fired or anything. So that's the only time I officially <laughs> turned something down. Maybe that's why you had a bad feeling. Tell <laughs> you knew nothing was going to happen. It wasn't your kind of target, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, I don't want a boring target. Uh, so if so, what, how did it go when you when you said no? What did you say? Hey, look, my guys need rest. Sorry, yeah. not, not this time. We had the right to say no. It was frowned on. Yeah, but you know they had at that time we had a couple new teams in camp. And uh, Rodney Head came in, and he was a good one zero. So he went out, and he came back, and said, "Hey, you know that target was pretty cool. We uh, slept a lot." 
dry hole. Dry hole. I said, really? <laughs> I, said, I had all these feelings, man. I was hyperventilating. Yeah. Terrible. I figured we were going to run into Ho Chi Minh and, and you know, a couple of divisions again for good luck. I hadn't seen a division in a month. <laughs> so I, you know, it's like, okay. But no. So you, and that kind of showed me how your mental state of mind, too. Because I was really, that's what I believed. Mm. That, and the system was such that you could turn it down. And uh, we took it from there. When you say that's what you believed, you you believed that it was a bad target? I just felt we, we had been so lucky. Mm-hmm. And going through the Christmas, Thanksgiving, and everything else, that our I just felt our number was going to be, we didn't know how. Uh-huh. And I just said, this could be the target. It's an MA target. And those were particularly, they were the, uh, the ones that are all along the DMZ River uh, west of Vietnam that went deeper into Laos. And they were nasty. We lost several teams up there. Mm-hmm. And I figured this could be our turn. So I was wrong. Uh-huh. Now, did you ever get that feeling again? Not not, not enough, strong enough to act on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the carrot in the back of my tiny mind. It was like, <laughs> the last time you thought you were going to die, you didn't. I had some guys that thought they were going to die every time we left the wire. <laughs> you know what I mean? God bless him. But he's, no, man, this could, night could be the night, man. No, I'm not feeling good about this one. And they'd always get their gear on. But I'd say, you oh, know, yeah. I always looked at it as a good sign. If certain people were scared, if they wouldn't wouldn't have been scared, I would have been nervous because they were so scared all the time. I think, man, this must be really stressful for him. <laughs> yeah, I never wrote the letter where like, dear mom and dad, I'm dead now. If you read this letter, I'm dead. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just felt. And hope that we somehow get through it. Uh-huh. And uh, and you're right about the scare thing. You you want that emotional edge. A little fear can go along. It's a great motivator. But I wouldn't I wouldn't go out with a guy if somebody was saying, "Hey man, I'm not afraid. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm afraid of you, dude. You go somebody else." I also used to get the feeling that if you were scared like that, if you were if you were scared and you were going to be hesitant. That was going to be bad. Sure. Like I, uh, I was more worried about guys that were like hesitant, or I felt like if they were hesitant on the battlefield, that would work out bad for them. The guys that I always felt like, okay, if someone's aggressive, not 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 unafraid and suicidal like that, but right. just hey, oh yeah, I'm gonna go do, I'm gonna we're gonna go kick ass right now. I always felt that was the attitude to have. Was to be aggressive. Was to be like, okay, yeah, we're. Oh, you want you got an op for us? Cool, we'll go do it. Now we turned down ops too. There was ops where we looked at and said, man, this is not good, and this is a massive amount of risk. I mean, there was areas where. There was areas where, uh, they they would take IED strikes on vehicles, and. Like, you know, and when a big ID hits a Humvee, everyone dies or oh, yeah. three out of five people die or something like that. I mean, it's it's very catastrophic. And there was one target they were looking at for us. They asked us to do. And the there was like one road going in. It had, oh. had multiple big ID strikes. And then they wanted us to, they were asking if we could take out mortar. It was either a mortar team or an IED in place. Or, but we were looking at it and where the mortars had been launched from were all over the place. So it was just it was one of the one of the types of missions where we looked at it and said, "Hey, there's got to be a better way to do this because uh, us going up there is not going to be worth it." Because a lot of your missions were point missions, right? What do you mean by that? They give you a target, get to the point, and wipe it out. Uh, I would say my first deployment it was go capture kill bad guys. That was my first deployment to Iraq. We were in Baghdad, where that's mostly what we were doing. Middle of the night, we'd find out where a bad guy was, we'd go get him. And that's what my second deployment in Ramadi, mostly what guys were doing was overwatch, sniper overwatch positions set up in buildings so that when the bad guys would either maneuver on friendly forces or they'd be out doing what they shouldn't be doing, right? the guys would take them out. So, so that's, that's pretty much the... And then there's all kinds of crap in between that. Everything from, you know... Everything from doing just reconnaissances of areas to counter mortar type situation. Just you know, a lot of other th- a lot of other things would happen, but primarily it was direct action missions going out to take out a target or these sniper Overwatch types. But then, you know, we'd be doing big clearances too, big conventional clearances. You know, we had our we called them jundis, which is jundi means it means soldier in in Arabic, right? And 
and so we call them jundies. That's what they call themselves, <clears throat> you know, jundies. But so we had jundies like you guys had little people, like you yeah. had indige forces. We had indige forces. They were jundies, and so we would do very conventional missions with the jundies of them and us. You know, we'd be overseeing them as they cleared big sections of the city, and we'd be working in conjunction with the army. So yeah, we did a little bit of everything, but um, but see that brings us back to our side of it, where you can give yourself a mental delusion, which is our mission is to go look mm-hmm. an area recon. So theoretically, you're going to get inserted quietly and go about your job, and that's different from you with mm-hmm. your point mission. It's a whole different frame of mind. So theoretically, okay, we're hoping to get in, do our mission, mm-hmm. to come back and report or find a fuel line, blow it up, or get the POW, get the wiretaps, give them intel where you're going out and doing your IED pickups and, mm-hmm. and mortars. That's entirely different. So at least in my mind, I think that's part of my self comfort factor we're going to get inserted and have a nice quiet mission for five or six days <laughs> take some pictures <laughs> that sounds know, great and come on back it's really cool yeah, yeah. we're yeah. behind enemy lines what percentage of operations would you guys get contacted on oh we left always left under fire the only question was how much never had well one the one uh where we got you opened up our discussion tonight yeah where we got pulled out. There's no fire there uh-huh. because they came in and got us. We had a great RON, mm-hmm. and we were going to get some POWs, but they pulled us out right away. So there's no gunfire on that mission. But other than that, every time we left under gunfire, it's the only question how much. Sometimes it looks like the whole jungle was lighting up. <laughs> Sometimes only be two or 300. Uh-huh. And yeah. yet you still fooled yourself into thinking, hey, this recon's going to be different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so I guess my point was I – looked at it and I still look at it if you are nervous about getting hurt if you're nervous about something going wrong to me that's when something goes wrong yeah when you're nervous about it now I'm not saying you should be arrogant about it and think oh we're gonna get away with whatever but I'm saying like when you're doing us even when you're doing like a sport you know even when you're doing some physical activity if you if you're afraid you might get injured to me that's when you get injured it's when the it's when you're when you're afraid, I think fear can hurt you. That being said, the other side of the coin is, if you have no fear, well, then you're definitely you're definitely at risk. He who hesitates is lost. There you go. So there's a dichotomy there that's oh, yeah. got to get balanced. Between yeah, and that's where we're so lucky. We, uh, you know, Hep and Sal did a great job of vetting our our indigenous troops, and to go from Spider Parks to Wolken to Bubba, and then back to Lynn Black. And then when I left the team, it was in Lynn's hands. Mm-hmm. And then I came back, Lynn's the one zero. Mm-hmm. What more could you ask for? So that was just a, you know, very fortunate. What was your uh, your mission planning like? So you guys get a tasking. How long does it, how long did you guys plan for? Uh, if it was just an area mission, uh, area reconnaissance, very little. With the wiretaps, obviously we did hours and hours of training on that. And then as time went on. You know, first it was just Sal who could do it. And then Sal trained Hep and Fook, the guys that were strong, to do it all. And um, as well, every, every aspect of it. And then we cross-trained each other. And we even had so that Hep would was beginning to teach a couple of the young guys basic English. So if any of us got killed, Hep could take over the radio or the Indig could take over. So a couple of guys like Chow and Hung as it, when Hung came on the team, they picked up English pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So we worked with them, and we practiced calling in, working on the radios, the problems with the batteries and things like that. So we cross-trained everything back and forth. And the wiretap was one particular one where we had several guys on the team trained up to do it all. Everything from knowing about the batteries, watching it, keeping the battery indicator, to getting a, uh, put the wire up the tree or a telephone pole, and when you came down, you covered it with mud. That was from that area. So it would look like it was part of that area mm-hmm. to try to cover the wire. But as far as the actual mission planning of, okay, here's where we're going in tonight, it didn't take you much because you were running repetitive type missions. Right. It's a high degree of similarity. The most important thing was the training so that when you made contact, you could take care of yourself and how to react, try to continue the mission. But these were like reconnaissance. So... Once you've been seen or compromised, the mission's compromised. 
when you would be flying in, what was your degree of certainty on where you were inserted? Oh, we knew very clear where we were going. So like in the case we would talk to Covey, we'd send the three LZs down to Saigon. Then Covey would go pick a site, and then he would tell me on the radio, okay, this is where we're going. And you would be, would you be looking at your map as you sure. inserted? And he knew what, what the frame was, so it would be in, within that map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that we, or that section of the map that we had cut I out. remember when we first, you know, as a radio man, believe it or not, when GPSs first came out, the radio man kind of got saddled with the GPS because it was a piece of electronic equipment. Right. And no one else could work with electronic <laughs> equipment. So, so I would be, usually, a lot of times, be carrying the GPS as opposed to the point man. And the point man, you know, which was still using map and compasses in the early 90s. But the GPS wouldn't always work well in a helicopter. And so sometimes it took me, you know, this was some training operations where I learned, oh, so I, I'm not where I think I am. And you get out and that GPS finally finds itself and you realize you're three clicks away from where you're supposed to be or whatever and it's bad. And that's why we'd go, I went back to, hey, when I'm in the helicopter, I'm on a map. <clears throat> so that way when my boss looks at me and says, hey, we, we, where are we supposed to be? Either yes or no. Like don't get out of the bird or okay, we're good. But but that, so I was thinking about that for you guys. You'd be doing the same thing as you approached. Okay, yep, there's that terrain feature. There's this other terrain feature. Cool, where we're, we're, we're supposed to be. Yeah, but, and then Laos also we wanted to know where the water was. Because some of the targets, they had more more streams of things, so we would carry less water. I would literally just carry one canteen with the purification pills so that if we were in for several days, like with Echo 4, by the end of the first day, uh, we had gone through some water, and took, we all took a turn going into this little stream, mm -hmm. put the purification pills in, hit the water, and let it sit for a couple hours before you drank it. Did you get acclimated where you needed less water? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Less water and... Um, I can truly say I never defecated in Laos. <laughs> Somehow the body just yeah. tightened up. And I mean, they had no shit pills that guys would take, so they literally would not go to the bathroom. Uh -huh. um, I worried about those. Yeah, that worries you know? me too. Oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for numerous reasons that the creative mind can think about. but So I didn't, but my body never had, and we never did it. The, and the... Did you guys didn't Is use, that TMI? <laughs> <laughs> did you guys have you guys did you guys use imagery at all? Like no. overhead imagery? Nothing. No. Um some of the uh uh gun the cobras no or no, some of the uh first cav helicopters had some uh I was trying to think what IR. They would have um the ability to see through the clouds and stuff. Oh, okay. And it was just a very primitive, but it was the beginning. Uh -huh. Whereas the, the Cobra gunships didn't have it. But the but, first calf could get low into the jungle and navigate in fog and stuff to get down to our guys. But no, you guys wouldn't see photographs of the areas where you were going into at all? No, the only time was down in Cambodia yeah. uh, for that mission there, where that was, um, now that base was really close to Saigon, close to MACV headquarters, and um, we may have had overviews. Mm -hmm. I just forget for up north. Mm -hmm. That one down there I, it stuck it stuck in my mind. And then what was your what was your op tempo like? In other words, how often were you going in the field? <laughs> well, through November December, we if we weren't on the if we weren't on the ground, we were getting ready to go back the next day. That's why it was such a push, 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 and. I rotated our little people out because they were just getting beat. And we had trained them up. So by November, December, all the cross training we had done in all those months, you know, Sal could take a day off. Uh, even Hep could take a day off. We had a couple of guys that could speak enough English. If anything happened to me or Bubba, they could take care of the radio, do the comms. And uh, so we rotated them through. But it was every day. And then if the weather came, we'd get a break. And um, so there was no, and the rule of thumb was, if you ran a mission for five days, you came back, you got five days off. So you could clean up, mm -hmm. get back in shape, get the team ready. But for that period of time, we had minimal teams. The teams at FOB1 had become so between disease, um, health, guys getting wiped out, teams getting blown away. 
Um, we were one of the few teams in camp that was fully operational. So that's why that was the other pressure we had. Like, I remember the S3 just saying, hey, you're the only guys we got. You're, you're going this afternoon. Here's your target. Go eat. Okay. So we did it. And then we got shot out to come back the next day. And so there was no – this. The op temple was supposed to be run a mission five to ten days if you're lucky. Well, it never happened. Some guys did. So don't get me wrong. We had mm-hmm. some guys that were able to stay on the ground. Amazing. But in our case, we didn't. So it would be very flexible. Did anybody take less than less than six guys? A few guys ran with four. And uh, at the end of my tour of duty, uh, second tour, I tried a four-man team, but we had this whole issue with the radio stuff, mm. just so we could move faster. Just yeah. wanted to try anything, something different, because when we had moved fast, we had success getting away from the LZ, and, it, and that caused them confusion. So if we broke what our SOPs were, it worked. Mm. But the eight-man was too much. Too much. I felt more comfortable with six. It gave us a lot of firepower. We had the M79 there. And then all the Americas had the M79s too. And then how often would you get legitimate R and R? you had one a year one for a tour of duty, you get five days anywhere you want it. So I went to Hong Kong, bought my stereo, by the time I had some poker money set up. <laughs> bought a nice stereo, state of the art, sent it home to mom and dad. They they my little brother put it together. He was good at that stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. And that's it. Other than that, there's no no one R and R. If we had gotten that POW, ah, then you would have gotten more. Yeah, we would have. What was the offer for catching a bad guy? Uh, an R and R anywhere in the world, and you got a hundred dollar bonus. How many days? Five, like a regular R and R. Dang. Oh yeah, it was. Oh yeah. That's why we lusted for that man. <laughs> I cried when Spider said no. A hundred bucks. How much was a hundred bucks? How about how much was your normal paycheck? How much did you make a month back then? Oh, I don't know. Um, when when we went through jump school, now I'm only a private E1, right? I got a hundred percent pay raise for my jump pay. I was getting paid fifty dollars a month. The jump pay was fifty five. There you go. So fifty five was a constant. Then later maybe E2 was like seventy five. I never paid. It was never enough. So a hundred bucks was like a hundred bucks was like a a month's pay basically. Yeah, least. that was a lot of money. Even then, a C note was a big deal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And then when you guys would come back, you were talking about this, how you would sit there and debrief. Would you debrief your your team? Would you guys sit down and debrief what happened, what went wrong, what went right? We always talked to little people. Um, maybe not right away because uh, S2 would want to know what happened. So we would go in for an immediate debrief, go back to the team, make sure they had food for the night and stuff, and then go back for a final uh, after-action report, which would go through – talking about everything from the vegetation, the type of hills, animals you encountered, all that kind of just crazy stuff, the fauna. Oh, my God. The questions they asked, it was just, after a while, it was like always the same. It was layoffs. Yeah, mm-hmm. triple canopy, yes, pretty dangerous. <laughs> the NVA are pretty dedicated. And then anything specific is off the target from the, from that that they could learn from. How long, how long did it take you to become the one zero? Well, in my case, um, I got in country in May. Spider put me on a team at the end of May. We trained June and July. Uh, had a couple in country, like little ambushes locally, and then we had a uh, the practice mission in August, and then we did a first wiretap, not a wiretap, but the Air Force sensors. We did two of those missions in September because you had the monsoons too. So a lot of it was between the rain. We had like weeks where it would just rain. It seemed like it rained every day. You ever see uh, horizontal rain? Uh, yeah. I don't think I've seen as much. So you guys would not run missions during the monsoon season? No. You, you, Just too much. Too much. You Weather was going to be too bad. You're, so, you're socked in. You you're couldn't socked. get out of the base. <laughs> the the kingbees couldn't get to the base. So how long So how long was that? Like four months before you were? Yeah. Four months. And and, and, Which, my, and, and how many missions did you run before you were one, a 1-0? One I had five missions under my belt. We had the two practice, the two um, wiretaps, and then Don Wolken, Echo 4. Mm-hmm. And by that time, um, when they came to me, they said, you know, Wolken got promoted to a cubby rider. And because um, Pat Watkins was leaving, there's an opening. So he went there, and they gave me the option. Are you ready? 
Well, we have seen what happened with Alabama with Lynn Black in October when they put a guy on a team that didn't had no experience. Mm-hmm. So I talked it over with Hep and Sal. I said, look, this is a situation. I don't know who they're going to give us. So what about I'll, I'll be the one zero. And Spider had thought that was okay to do it. Talked to Watkins. And uh, they all said, well, you're ready if you want to try it. And we didn't know who, because they had new people coming into mm-hmm. camp. And some of these guys were the older ones who had no experience on layoffs. We didn't want anything to do with them. And they had some of the younger guys that were coming in, like um, like Jim Robinson, who was on the team, for one mission. And um, we didn't know how they would stand up. So our guys were happy, and then Bubba came in. Mm-hmm. Bubba and the guy named the Frenchman, Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman came in together, and the Frenchman got picked for Virginia, and I got Bubba. They were buddies. They'd gone through training group together. Yeah, that's – you so you'd been in the army for like a couple of years, and you yeah. were in charge of a of a recon team. Yeah, you know, got in the army tomorrow. December '66, became a one zero in October '68. So you figure two years, almost two years, yeah. Because the whole SF training between that and going through basic jump school, and then we had that uh, training before Vietnam, the RTT training, which was different. But that's just because we're combo geeks. Mm-hmm. Oh, the RTT training was just radio. Radio teletype. Got it. Got they it. wanted top secret clearance men on those machines. How much did you see the tactics that you guys were using change over time? Um, I think by the time, like when you read We Few by Nick Brockhausen, mm-hmm. some of those guys were all carrying either RPDs or an M60. Mm-hmm. So they were just going in heavier and um, they would go into bigger team mm-hmm. and um, they were just anticipating the contact more. Whereas we thought we would try to go in and try to escape and evade mm-hmm. to the point where you hope that you can get at least some of the mission done or get some intel reports about troop movements, trucks, stuff like that, or get a good wiretap. So the biggest thing that changed was guys started going in heavier and actually bringing automatic weapons oh, yeah. or belt-fed machine guns. Sure. That makes sense. I Every single time I read any of your operations, I want <laughs> nothing more than a belt-fed machine gun. <laughs> so I, do we. We didn't know who was going to carry the yeah, damn thing. Yeah, the SEALs had uh, the stoner. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you guys ever think about using that? We thought about it a lot, but and it was a great system. We heard many great reports about it. But again, the stoner system you needed all the ammo you had to get the supply system set up and we just weren't sure if we were going to be able to get the guarantee if mm-hmm. we convert it who would it be just the americans we want everybody with common weapons mm. so that if somebody gets blown up their weapon gets blown they know how to use the other guy's weapon got it and you have the same magazines same everything rounds, all that sure and what about the mission set itself did you guys, did you notice that change over time while you were there? Later, we began to get more point targets. Like in on the ground, one of my favorite stories was uh, the Frenchman. Mm-hmm. He goes into a, a Cecile-type mission. Um, the CIA comes and says, we know about the NVA. They're floating f- uh, 55-gallon drums down the river into a storage area deep in Laos. So we want you guys to go in, but we don't trust you with the device. They had a device that they screwed into a 55-gallon drum. Mm-hmm. So what we're gonna do is. And that would be like a tracking device? No, no, explosive in nature. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. So here's what, so, so we're gonna meet you on this hilltop in Laos. So Doug was the one one on uh, RT Virginia. Gunther Wald was the one zero. They go in and hump for three days, get to the mountaintop, there's the CIA with a couple guys. Okay, here's your device. Go install it. <laughs> now, come to the wall was a Marine, so you'd think that he'd be the guy doing the swimming, right? He goes, I'm an E6. Frenchman, you're an E4. Hit the water, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so the CIA gave the explosive device, hump down the mountain, get to the river, and then now they're on a the river with all the stuff going by, the drums. And some have NVA troops riding the drums or being present with a boat or something. Mm-hmm. So in between all this, Doug strips down, 
goes in, gets a drum, brings it back, puts in the explosive device, swims it back out, and comes back soaking wet and not happy. I mean, <laughs> and he's from Southern California, so he's, <laughs> he's really not happy. But two days later, they're getting extracted now. The king bees come, extract, and they're getting extracted. There's this huge explosion and it had sonic boom that literally moved the aircraft, and the guys were on a string swinging from the sonic boom. Look back, there goes the fuel dump. Wow. Beautiful mission. Yeah, that, that's So those awesome. are kind. So the point mission, the wiretaps in the pipelines, we have more reports of pipelines, and then also they were doing some trail work trying to figure out how they were, uh, it looked like it would be a stream, but they had things, that's one of our missions, like yeah, the Orchid yeah. mission, yeah, yeah. to get in there to see, well, how they're going through this water, and can we just go in, and while you're there, blow it up, maybe with a truck on it. Check. Uh, let's talk a little bit about gear. And you put, you actually have a section in, in Saw Chronicles, and it's in Across the Fence, too, where you talk about stuff you carry and stuff that you didn't carry. And uh, some of the stuff that you didn't carry, <laughs> no underwear. Never. No socks. Never. <laughs> and that's because you're, you just want to stay dry as much as possible. Yeah. And both those things just hold water and keep moisture in. Yeah. And uh, Lynn Black, uh, when he came, well, I had a maid that was stealing all my underwear. Because I went over with eight or ten pair of the jockey shorts, right? And, <laughs> and so I was down on my last pair. And the maid was literally stealing them because they could sell them on the black market. They're relatively clean, relatively new. <laughs> Mom bought me a whole bunch of stuff with socks and everything. So we had, we had army socks. But so anyways, I talked to Lynn and said, oh, I can't believe my maid's been stealing my underwear. Cause we pulled down his little eye down. There's my underwear. Mm-hmm. So I said, here, take the last one. Have a good day. And Lynn goes, don't wear that stuff because you get jungle rot, mm-hmm. crotch rot. And he says, same thing. Put away your socks. Well, you know, the first couple of weeks, the jungle boots were really tough on my feet, but he was right. Yeah, once you get them, once you get your feet broken in and yeah. the jungle boots broken in. And then so you go through the water. We, we did some very country stuff. We were in the rice paddies. Oh, my God. But they would dry out quicker. You didn't have to worry about the socks. So no helmet. Never. No body armor. Nope. And your body armor sucked back it then. It sucked too. back then. It was big, clunky. It was just heavy. It didn't work heavy. well. It didn't work well yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no entrenching tool? Never. No bayonet. No sleeping bag, no hammock, no poncho, no poncho liner, no ground pad. Correct. You are not traveling for comfort. Never. <laughs> we had to carry it, as you know. Yeah. You know that feeling? Yeah. What well, you're taking to the field, you're carrying. You don't have your maid yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. That that rucksack gets heavy, too. <sighs> so quick. Yeah. <laughs> And ours was like small. We had the indigenous rucksacks. Uh-huh. And and so once you put the radio and put the sweater underneath the radio so it protect your back, and then you throw some rations, some extra, a couple extra ammo magazines in there, and then extra hand grenades, M79 rounds, and a battery for good luck. Man. <laughs> yeah. You guys... Uh, no dog tags, no military ID or ID of any kind, no rank, no Correct. name tags, no jump wings, no CIB, no patches, no unit identifier, nothing. No pictures of mama. No pictures of mama. Right. Totally slick. So those are the things you didn't carry. Things you did carry. Car 15. Oh, love it. You love the car 15. Oh, yeah. So when I went back to my second tour, uh, Rock Myers was an S4. He was, he, he'd been wounded. I came back. He says, you're back. So I got a present for you. He gave me a brand new car 15. It was still in the box. Take it out. It's still in it. all the tin foil and all the oils and greases and stuff. And you take it out. Took it down to the range. It was perfectly zero. Never touched that weapon. That's crazy. Just put a little uh, cloth strap on it and went to work. And and you never had problems with that weapon? Never. Yeah. They. Um, Did yours have a forward assist on it? Did you? Yep. Had just, a forward assist. Yeah. So that was a that was a car 15. Wow. So the M16 with a, with a classable stock yeah. and a shortened barrel. Yeah. So it's weird so many people, and myself being one of them, complain about the car the car 15 or the M4. 
frame. And now the M4s are a lot nicer. I mean, the M4s well, are a lot nice. heavier, too. You got the rails and everything oh, on. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, put we, the lights. we load things. Those are, they look like. You got yeah. everything but a cigarette <laughs> lighter on there. <laughs> Some guys, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have that on there, too. <laughs> so that's awesome. You use the cravat for your sling. Yes. So I thought, well, yeah. Uh, I did that uh, during my second tour. They had the cravat. It's quiet. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, God forbid, if you ever needed a cravat. Because mm-hmm. I always carried it. I always wore one around my neck, had one on my head, and then one on the car 15. And of course, you carried bandages. Yeah. We had cravats in case as at the very bottom of the rucksack. We would get this sort of uh, one of those things that never wear a sling. <laughs> Some guys would say that, get caught up, and that's just, man, especially when you're in a leadership position, you need a sling because you got to look at your map. You got to pull out, you know. Oh, yeah. You got to do stuff, you know. <laughs> and the other thing is, you don't have a sling and you get blown up. Yeah. Get, where's your weapon? You have no idea when you wake up. No. So, yeah. Um, but then there's some, you know, some people just, they wouldn't carry a sling. Mark Lee was one of my machine gunners. He just, no sling. Nope. That was like really? the man thing to do was no sling. Whew. On yeah. an M60, or these days a Mark 48. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, How strong is this guy? Strong. <laughs> yeah. Strong. <laughs> M79, you carried, sawed off. Oh, yes. I cannot believe that me and my guys did not think of sawing off our M79s, because <laughs> I guarantee you guys would have sawed off the M79s. Oh, yeah. My first self-inflicted wound was from a sawed off M79. What'd you do? <laughs> well, we were in a process of cutting them down. Uh-huh. So the question was, how far can you cut the barrel down? So we finally cut it right down to that last hinge mm-hmm. where um, <laughs> it's the last one that's yeah. that's to the to the bottom of the frame. Got it. So you crack, put the round in. So yeah. we, we kept bringing it back. So we're down at the range, we're there. And the question was, because you cut the barrel off, you needed the number of rotations. Yeah. Now our, our weapons guys knew that. But I was, me and Rick Howard were combo guys and I didn't really ask. It's just, the question was, fire and see. So on this day, I fire it fairly close. It goes, bing, pop, and that noise M79 makes. Yeah. And then it went off like, pop, bing, like that. And I, I go, oh, damn. So I go to Rick Howard and said, I think a bee just hit me. He pulled my stripes. You dumbass, you just <laughs> shot yourself. <laughs> my first self-inflicted wound. But the good news was that M79 worked. And then, of course, we cut the handle down yeah. to just have enough that you could hold on to. Because that way is less, less weapon yeah, but you still had all the firepower. Oh, I mean, yeah. that cut that weapon down by half. Oh, yeah. I was looking at the pictures you have in your book. It's That thing is tiny. Tiny but effective. <laughs> Charlie hated those things. And and at one point, you had a you had a holster for that thing? Yeah. Talk that's the, about that's John the, Wayne. That's still, that's still in Laos with my uh, SOG knife. Dang. I had it cra- Somebody had crafted it, and I put it on. So, yeah, that, that was perfect. Yeah. But... Uh, Never had another one. From that point, I just like everybody else. We just carried it on the D ring. We taped it so it would be quiet, though. You carried 34 20 round mags, each each with 18 rounds each. So that's 612 rounds. For good luck, yeah. And sometimes we carried extra, like a pouch with a couple extra clips in in case we needed to reload the uh, 34 magazines and you went on you mentioned you had a few missions where you were down to your last one or two at least twice i remember echo four was the first time did you always hang on to your magazines when you were out it depended on the degree of intensity of the firefight if i had time uh, we keep s4 happy i'll bring back my damn magazines did you stuff them in your shirt yeah yeah because the web gear would be tight, so uh, and our jungle uh, fatigues were out. Yeah. So you had the pants, but then the harness from the uh, from the web gear would, would yeah, hold everything in. When I came in, we'd stuff mags in our shirt, and then but with body armor, you can't do that. So now guys <laughs> carry like pouches or just drop them in their leg cargo pockets or whatever. Yeah, and our preferred thing was the BAR belts because you could put four magazines in and one across the top. And it was a nice pouch, the BAR belts mm-hmm. that they had from World War II. Mm-hmm. Perfect for the uh, 20 round magazines. That's a lot of, just, you know, we would normally carry seven to 10, 30 round mags. So we carried like, I mean, sometimes I guess more than that, but not no 600 rounds. But you weren't anticipating being alone for a while. No, we Easy. weren't fighting divisions worth of people either. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> 
Yeah, it, you know, and I guess we did what we did have is we always had heavy machine guns. You know, Ooh. so that makes a big difference too. I guess you know you, we would have Mark forty eight, which is seven six two, and then the Mark forty six, which is five five six. You know, it's, that's basically like a little stoner and a, and a M sixty. The modern versions of those two things, but yeah, you know, so you we had, had a saw too, right? Yeah, well, that's the the Mark forty six is a saw. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we had those, and those guys would carry a lot of rounds, a lot of rounds, like eight hundred to a thousand, sometimes more on the. Yeah, my stuff on carried carried like that over a yeah. thousand. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I had guys go Winchester, go run out of bullets. Really? Yeah, with that many. So yeah, I guess maybe that was the the differentiator. You carried ten to twelve frag grenades. That's a lot of frag grenades. <laughs> I guess when you're going picking fights with divisions, you got to carry a lot of frag grenades. Oh yeah, and they always kept the last one. That was the one up here. <clears throat> Just in case I'm not going to be a POW. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Absolutely. We would carry. I don't know. Well, I would carry like one or two. <laughs> well, how often would you be? Able, <laughs> I just got laughed at. Know. It's official. Straight up laughed at. Yeah. How often would you? How often would you hey, need more than two? Though, yeah, hopefully never. Yeah, you know, and especially I'm in a leadership position. I'm hopefully not hucking grenades, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, the, you know, the big difference, especially in Ramadi. I mean, in Ramadi, I, I remember explaining to the guys that relieved us. You know, we had a big overhead imagery. And yeah, I, and I put my hand on the map, and I said, "No matter where you put your hand on this map, you'll be touching a friendly unit." So, like, and you know, this is you know probably within three to five hundred meters of you. Anywhere you were in Ramadi, there was a friendly unit. Really? So that's why, you know, you were going to get reinforcements. You were going to get tanks. You were going to get Bradley fighting vehicles. So, yeah. Yeah, but in between that time, you earned your pay. You <laughs> have to earn your pay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was talking to Leif. Well, Leif, that's another thing. So it's Leif, Leif's got a chapter in Dichotomy of Leadership where he's talking about preparing, over, pre- over preparing for too many contingencies. And he talks <laughs> about, it was his first patrol out on, out going out with the Marine Corps in a daytime patrol. And he's talking about how much stuff he carried. He carried all this stuff, but one of the things he carried is, you know, eight grenades or something like that. And, you know, he reflects on how that was just way too many. And I was like, hey man. You know, Tilt doesn't go out in the field with less than 10. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. A different AO. Different we probably would have adjusted our, I wonder, our I grenades. Wonder, I wonder count. how much you would have changed if you had to wear body armor or if you would have decided not to or whatever. You know, it's interesting. That's an interesting development. I'll tell you, if we even had today's state-of-the-art, I never would have worn it. Too it's much. just too, too much. Too much weight. And you have to be able to move. I mean, yeah. you know. Um, Not to mention, you're so damn lucky no bullets are going to hit you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why I crawled a lot, try to keep a low profile. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I probably would have declined it because of the weight, yeah. as it was, uh, in our AO. Yeah. Maybe another AO with different situations, more flexibility with assets. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that's interesting is you know, one of the reasons why you wear a helmet now isn't just to protect your head, it's because that's where your nods mount onto, your night vision. Oh, yeah. Your night vision mount onto your, so you they do have a contraption that's like a headband looking thing. I don't even think they make it anymore. But, right. But where well, you could wear that, but you know, your nods mount on your, your night vision mounts on your helmet, your, that's just the way it is. I've seen those like where the guy flips down the yep, nods, it's really it. cool, I want one. That's it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's go time when those yeah. nods flip down. All right, but instead of wearing a helmet, you wore a cravat. A, a green cravat. A green cravat on your head, one around your neck. You had you wore regular army fatigues. Yeah, there was the sterile fatigues that had um, a two pockets up top with an angle mm-hmm. and two pockets down here that hung out. And then we customized them. We had uh, the, the tailor put in pockets here. Mm-hmm. So for mirrors, maps, morphine, servettes, it's all close right here. And then we had uh, pockets on each arm. To put other things up, there were pin flares, other things yeah. that would be vital. And that's to the something mission. that we did too. So we did even before, even in the nineties, before the everyone, because now the fatigues come issued with pockets on the arms and right. everything. But we used to take them off and sew them on, and that's where you'd keep your your pens and your notebooks and your pen flares and your and your signal mirror. 
Yeah. And then on the ones on your chest, you had maps and morphine and extra notebook, your URC 10 emergency radio. And then you had a, you wore a watch, a Seiko. Yeah. A luminous watch. You wore gloves. Always. And just cut out the uh, thumb, index finger, and then the uh, middle finger, just cut it to the tip. So you could grab the tape on the yep. magazines for the firefights. Yep. Same thing, same thing we would do. But you always wear gloves, glo- otherwise your hands are just getting destroyed out oh, in the jungle. Forget about it, yeah. Because <laughs> a lot of times we wind up, get, have to get a new pair of gloves. We just get torn up so much in the jungle and fatigues. Man, those wait a minute, wait a minute vines and the thorns. Because, <laughs> you know, they're, wait a minute, when you get caught into it, the, the, you would walk into it, your leg goes into the pins that's come together. So you had to stop and then get the pin to get your leg out. Otherwise, mm. it goes deeper into your into your leg. What about, did you carry any kind of mosquito net for your head? No. How come? Never thought about it. Mosquito net for the head? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to, uh, this was like the most brilliant thing. I think it was an Australian guy who told me this. You, I would have like a little square of mosquito netting. Mm-hmm. And when we would stop patrolling, I would take out that little square, put it over my head, right over my right over my floppy hat, and tuck it in. And all of a sudden, you not getting chewed apart by mosquitoes. Oh yeah, one night, we, the one time we did a, a practice mission east of the Ashaw. In the morning, I couldn't I couldn't open my eyes. I had been bitten so much by mosquitoes. My face was so puffed out. You need that mosquito now. I needed it <laughs> to help. Had I only known. <laughs> I should have thought about I should have thought about that one. I had a guy, we were <laughs> doing some training, and none of us had mosquito netting except for the officer. And so the officer was sleeping heartily, like just fully. <laughs> and one of the other young enlisted guys was catching mosquitoes and putting them inside this guy's <laughs> while he was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> He woke up covering his, but not only those mosquitoes were trapped in there with him. They were Ooh. trapped in there. They couldn't get out. They were just having a feast. Trapped hungry mosquitoes. Trapped hungry oh. mosquitoes. Yeah. Nasty. So, but no, not for you. No mosquito net. No. I hadn't thought about that one. <laughs> leeches. Oh. You guys ran into a lot of leeches. Always. Yeah, we, we had the uh, bug repellent for that. And so you spray even, the bug repellent on them once you got sucked on by a leech. Yeah, they would instantly fall off. But you always try to wait, try to just see if you could jiggle them off because you knew the re- bug repellent could be smelled mm-hmm. by the bad guys. So hmm. then you had your on your web gear, which was the old World War II web gear. You had on your left harness, you had your K bar, handled down, or a sog knife. Or sog knife until you yeah, lost it. Until I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need to do a recovery mission for. Get that oh, sog no, knife man. back. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, handle down. Sure. That's how you rolled. Yeah, because this way you pull it out and you're ready. Mm-hmm. Whereas up here, you have to pull it out in the jungle, you might get caught up in the vines. Got it. Got it. Uh, you had hand grenades there because you were basically covered in hand grenades. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, smoke. You had there. You had some some you know bandages there on your right harness. You had your strobe light. You had more hand grenades. You had your D ring, and you had more smoke grenades. Then on your belt, you had one canteen usually. It depends on the target. Sometimes mm-hmm. it'd be maybe two, but usually one. And then one. I had the second one in my in my backpack, rucksack. You normally wouldn't get. Would you get thirsty? Was there normally enough water? Uh, in the jungle, it wasn't as bad as Cambodia. So, but yeah, you get thirsty because you're humping mm-hmm. up and down. Um, there was a couple times we, particularly in that day, we went straight up with the orchids. Yeah. That was a day we got we were all out of water. Not fun. No. So you had one canteen. You had a Willie Pete grenade. You had your survival axe, which was the Frank and Warren survival axe type two. Indeed. That's what type you one wasn't my. I wanted to type two. <laughs> I looked him up and uh, had like a hook at the top. Like yeah, another so blade. when you so went you through, could, and when you came back on the on the back pool, you could try to make yeah. it effective to cut. It, particularly, we're cutting vines. Mm-hmm. That thing came with you all the time. Every mission. I got it home under my desk right now in case an intruder comes in. I'm ready. I like it. (laughs) 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 If intruders feeling lucky, good luck. (laughs) Meet Mr. Tilt. 
uh, compass around your neck. You used a cravat for your belt. Yes. So the belt I was talking about before is the belt of your web gear, but just the Correct. belt of your pants was just a was a cravat. You carried a Swiss Army knife. You carried a gas mask. Always. You always carried a gas mask. Yeah, we had teams that got hit, <clears throat> and uh, well, aid camps that had been hit by the enemy used tear gas. gas. Sure. And they use. I I forget what the the incidents were, but there were a couple times that the enemy had used gas on our people in Laos as well as with a CIA operation. Now, we weren't told that, but we had cold evidence that they had done it and that they could hit one of our recon teams. So we had to carry that bulky-ass thing at I, all times. I was going to say, but and this is this was the, the concern was tear gas. Well, tear gas or who else knows what yeah. they had. I mean, these are communists. They're not yeah. going to play by rules of engagement. Yeah. I mean, they're not in Laos. Because, yeah, that's what I, I, I was thinking with all this crap that you're carrying— and a gas mask are just huge and bulky. Yeah, left hip, and out of carried that all the time. Had to, and we used them uh, twice. And uh, um, we, in fact, we had designed a mission. One of our missions was to, when we got distracted from a target, an MA target, we saw a road that had um, a little guard station, a guard station, but it was north of the DMZ River. So the quest for getting um, a live POW, mm -hmm. we found out that we had one of our guys that did a VR and flew a couple of rooms, and he saw these little way stations along the way. So our thought was, we'll get gas, gas them. And they said they had a, a knockout <laughs> gas at the time, right? So we practiced for a couple of days with tear gas, and we had to get the helicopter pilots and the gun crews, everybody with their masks, and then have masks that they could talk to each other and then talk to us. Uh -huh. And um, so we practiced for several days, training with the helicopters coming in. The, and the mission plan was go up in the middle of the day, go to one of those camps, hit it, gas it, go in and scarf them up and go home, get a five-day pass. <laughs> and 100 bucks. Yeah, but they, uh, and they had a special knockout gas that we're supposed to use. And at the end, they 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 wouldn't let us. They wouldn't give us the gas. Or I don't know if they had it, uh -huh. but they wouldn't give us the knockout gas. So then another mission came up. That we had a bright light to run, and we never got back to the concept of doing it. And you carried a. You usually carried one grenade for your forty mic mic. That was tear gas. Always, sure, in case we needed it. And that was what would your what would your tactic be on using that? Uh, usually, it would be to. Uh, um, you know, to create disorder. Because when you hit somebody with tear gas, even if it's far away, it, th that would distract them for a second, take their mind off of business, or at least make them have a harder time to kill us. And we also carried a gas, a gas grenade local. Oh, okay. So we had in our SOP uh, procedure that uh, the word, or I forget what the heck it was, but we had a, a signal or a sign for CS gas. So if we're getting so overrun that we have to pop a CS to break the break the charge, which some of our teams did, mm -hmm. um, they used it in, in the Operation Tailwind quite effectively, mm -hmm. saved their bacon. So the idea would be, hey, this is gonna linger. Whereas a frag grenade, it goes off. You either wound guys or you don't. You either kill guys or you don't. But that's it. It's over. Yeah. Whereas gas, you you can really disrupt them because now you got guys coughing and yeah. puking or whatever. And, it's, and, it, and it hangs to the ground, and then it hangs around as long as the wind is going to let it hang around. Got it. Left pant pocket, you had a marking panel, large and small. Right pant pocket, pen flares, de dehydrated lerp ration, bug repellent for leeches, an extra cravat, an extra bandage. Did anybody carry IV? Uh, some of our guys did. Okay. Uh, Lynn Black did, and... Uh, we had, I think Sal carried one. One of our indig carried one. We had an IV and the um, saline solution that came in a canister. So we always had one in case we needed it. Mm -hmm. In your rucksack, you got your you got your PRC twenty five, which you guys called it a prick twenty five. Yeah, I think I was I think I was outlawed from calling it a prick because <laughs> that that PRC twenty five. So the PRC twenty five was replaced by the PR-77, the PRIC-77, right. 
and I want to say it was 1969 or something like that. When I got to SEAL Team One, that's what I used. It was a P, it was one of the radios that we had oh, in our inventory. It was a PRC 77, <laughs> yeah, which came directly from the PRC 25. So you'd carry that. You had the big whip antenna, but you wouldn't. You'd have the little tape antenna on there, so you don't right. get identified as the radio guy because otherwise you're gonna uh, yeah because well you just pulled your it head. over. Your, uh, in our case, the antenna, we just get it and bend it down, come underneath your arm and stick it into the fatigues, mm-hmm. so it'd be low profile on it. Then you had uh, your your one sea rat of fruit. That was like your that was that was your your go to. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd carry one of those, two of those, something like that. Uh, use just one because after a while, you know, we kept getting shot out so often. It's like okay, I'm not too much weight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had extra. You had your extra mags in there. You got your extra M seventy nine rounds. You had your army long sleeve sweater. You had a plastic rain jacket, toilet paper, even though you apparently never used it. Correct. <laughs> but you could also use it to pack wounds. There you go. Uh, extra battery for the for the Prick 25 and the URC-10. Extra smoke grenades. Uh, extra canteen of water. Extra ration. And then you had your Claymore or Claymores with five and 10 second fuses. And on top of that, the twenty-two caliber hush puppy on some operations. Sometimes, yeah. And all this, when you'd weighed yourself, you'd be about 90 pounds heavy. Right around there, yeah. And it was a, it was an old rickety-ass scale, so I just jumped on <laughs> carrying everything just to see what it was. Well, that's a heavy loadout. I'll tell you right now, that's a heavy loadout. That is absolutely all of 90 pounds. When you start talking about 600 rounds of ammunition, when you start oh. talking about 10, 10 to 12 hand grenades, smoke, smoke grenades are heavy as hell. They got all that material in them that yeah, smokes. Sure. Yeah, they're big giant beasts. And the Willie Peter was the extra Willie heavy. Peter's heavy too. <laughs> uh, uh, crazy amount. Um, and I guess, like I said, and like you said, you're carrying all that firepower because of the operations. You're carrying a crazy amount of firepower because you're doing cr- crazy operations. Yeah, and again, from talking to the other one zeros, Pat Watkins and McGovern. Because initially, I don't know what the loads were, but they kept increasing it because there were several times and they ran out of ammo. Already got close to running out. And that's the last thing in the world you want, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, that's a little over two hours right now. and uh, It's been a quick night. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But um, you got any, you got any closing thoughts? No, uh, just to thank you for having me in three times. Uh, th- we've gained some extra attention. Like I said before, uh, we were just chatting. Is uh, the stories always felt war significant in terms of uh, the stories about what Sog did and the men. More importantly, the men. And also, like I said to you earlier, my stuff is hairy. But if you had a hairy scale on one to ten. I mean, I feel I put myself at a five or a six compared to the guys that got the Medal of Honor, the guys that didn't come home, that went down fighting, getting overrun by the NVA. And we we could just talk about Medal of Honor missions of guys standing there just fighting off and dying on the LZ, putting their people on the helicopter first. John Kedenberg, Johnny Galhoun, time and again, our SF guys would take care of the little people, we even get them on the chopper, get them out. And, uh, so those stories I felt with great valor. And um, so I thank you for the little extra exposure to your audience. Well, we'll I appreciate we'll, that. We'll, we'll, we'll bring you back on and we'll get, and I know you and I are talking about other guys that we're gonna get sure. to come on and uh, all those stories of those heroes, we'll, we'll get them out there because uh, people wanna know. I wanna hear them, I wanna know as much as I can about them and, and, and you know, we'll, we'll get you back. Uh, well, I'm ready to roll. So thank you, and I thank you for the time. And your also, time. you're on. A, you're like Mr. Social Media now. Apparently. I didn't realize that. You have to give me a full briefing when we're done here. So <laughs> you're on Twitter. You and Echo Charles, give me squared away. You're on Twitter. We haven't quite figured out Twitter yet. Apparently, you're. That makes two of us. Your old your old Twitter handle was at Sog Chronicles. Your new Twitter handle is at John Stryker Meyer. That's that's where it's at right now. Yes, sir. That's right. All right. So people will start trying to communicate with you on that. 
Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call the president and say, hey, President Trump, could you help me out on my Twitter hey, feed? President here? Trump t- tweets all the time. The king of Twitter. Yeah, he is. He is. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. You, no, you'll be able to. You'll be able to. You'll, you, you, when you, that's the incredible thing about Twitter. Is yeah. Everybody has a platform. It's incredibly good. Sometimes it's impre- incredibly bad, but everybody has a platform. So, no, the cool thing about it is people have been, you know, uh, talking to me and hitting me up and just thanking you for your service, thanking you for coming on, thank you for sharing the story. So it'll be cool that they'll be able to actually thank you instead of just telling me to tell you thank and you. And just so. go to our website. They got the link in there for email for the old fashioned route, sogchronicles.com. Sogchronicles.com. Airborne. Awesome. Yeah, people, We're there. people on there. I wanted to close out reading one last thing. And this is your, your dedication for the book, Sog Chronicles 1. And it said, it says, this book is dedicated to the Sog men and their courageous indigenous team members who went across the fence into Laos, Cambodia, North Vietnam during the eight year secret war and to the, and to the brave aviators and crew members of the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, and our fearless allies from the 219th South Vietnamese Air Force's Special Operations Squadron, the legendary King Bees who supported, who supported SOG teams on the ground. This book is also for every man in SOG and the aviators who made the ultimate sacrifice far outside the boundaries of conventional Vietnam War that America saw reported on the nightly news. I'll give the closing note. Absolutely. Today, 1,598 Americans that are MIA in Southeast Asia from the Vietnam War, 50 Green Berets alone in Laos are still MIA including 140 plus aviators that died strictly supporting our mission. And this week, the National League of POW MIA families is having its 50th annual meeting in uh, Arlington on this topic. They've been diligent, and uh, Ann Mills Griffiths is the uh, CEO. She's putting it all together. They work with the Pentagon. She had been on this mission from day one, and our prayers are with them to continue because they're pushing to bring our people home. Absolutely, and if you want to put that out, either on SOG Chronicles, put a link to how people can support that cause, people will absolutely support that cause. Oh, okay, we'll do that, absolutely. They deserve it. Yes, absolutely, we can make that happen. Wow, thank you. Airborne. All right, well, like I said, you have an open invite on here. (laughs) Anytime you want, you let us know. We're here, uh, and we'll get some of your friends on, and thanks for coming on yourself. Thanks for sharing your stories, and most of all, more than anything else, Thanks for your service and sacrifice. Likewise, brother. You've been there. You've seen the elephant. (laughs) Appreciate it. And once again, John Stryker Meyer has left the building. Tilt. Tilt. Has left the building. Mm -hmm. Finishing up three podcasts with John Stryker Meyer. Yeah. Sappers. Sappers. I asked him what sappers was were because there was various references, first, second, and this past one mm-hmm. to sappers, and more notably, one if you remember the movie Predator, the first one. Mm-hmm. He says sappers. Those sappers been on us since blah blah blah. Whatever this. Interesting. Say. And I always wondered what's a sapper. Special group, Vietnam, North Vietnamese group of anti-American fighters. Trained specifically, right? Right? I got that right, right? Did I remember that correctly? Yeah, that's that's the definition that John Stryker Meyer just gave you. Dang. Anyway, all right, cool. What else, Jocko? Well, I would say, no, awesome, awesome to have uh, John Stryker Meyer on here. And just to hear him talk about what human beings can do, mm-hmm. right? What people, human beings can do. And it's interesting because you ever look at dogs and you think, oh, there's a little tiny chihuahua and then there's like a a German shepherd. Yeah. And you think those are the same animal, Yeah. right? Yes. They are, yeah. technically. Mm-hmm. Technically, yeah. Human beings. Same deal. <laughs> like you look at yeah. John Stryker Meyer, he's like a German shepherd. Yeah. And then you got people running around their chihuahuas. No yes, offense against are. the chihuahuas, but your chihuahua's not going to 
Yes. And fend off hordes. No, right? no. Chihuahua's not calling in airstrikes, danger close. No. So I guess my point is that human beings do have capabilities. And I think that when you listen to Tilt, you realize that I can probably do better. I know that's what I realize. I think yeah. I can do better than I'm doing right now. Yeah. I think I can I can push the envelope a little bit. Yeah. Move further toward the potential. The part that kind of will probably will stick with me is how he didn't carry poncho, like the sleeping no, stuff. No comfort. No, it no was comfort just like, whatsoever. oh, I wanna, if we have to go sleep, I'm just going to sleep right here in, yeah, in the ant, in the dirt. on the ant hill. Yeah, just whatever. whatever. Yeah. See, that part, when I was a kid, <laughs> when, I was a kid, when I was a kid, that was viable. But now you need comfort. Yeah, I'm weak. Yeah, so that part, maybe I have to mentally maybe work on that, you know? All right. Let's face it. There are ways to get better. Yes, sir, there is. Maybe sleeping without a ground pad is one of them. Yeah. Maybe another one is training jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah, big time. That's a, I mean, so I was training the other day with Noah Oliver, right? Mm-hmm. And Noah's been training, and he he's kind of sorting out. You know how you go in phases of training partners? Mm-hmm. You know, like, man, I've been training with Andy for, like, the last, like, three months, you know, mm-hmm. more than it. So, man, but he's been, like, he beat me down the other day, mm-hmm. yesterday, yesterday, day before, whatever. And, yeah, he beat me down. But at the same time, I didn't leave thinking, like, oh, my gosh, jiu-jitsu sucks, you know? When you get beat down, you think of, okay, what do I need to do to... That's to, the correct attitude. Yeah. Have. Well, especially well, when you have training partners that you like and you trust and you you know, you know you enjoy what you get from the training or whatever, regardless mm-hmm. if you got beat down or not, I think your mind ought, will sort of automatically go to that, I think, most of the time. It's usually when, I don't know, other circumstances, then you'll be all salty and be like, make excuses or something like that. Either way. So I'm thinking... You know, of all the things. And then I arrive at the concept of, man, the, in any other situation, you take that kind of like just physical turmoil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not only did you get beat, but it was like kind of hard, you know. Mm-hmm. Usually I don't feel this good about it. I'm not looking forward to the next time, you know? Like, come on, let's face it. You do a hard met con, you're like, boom, I'm glad that's over with. But in this case, you are looking forward to Um, the next one. Yeah, you're looking forward to the next one. You're looking forward to just training more in general. There's a short-term and long-term payoff for this jujitsu thing. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Very true. Not to mention the capability that you wind up with. So we're pro jujitsu is what we're getting at. We're a hundred thousand percent. Short term and long term. There's no there's no dichotomy. There's just short term gain, long term gain. Yes, in my opinion. But it could be argued that Uh, oh it's hard. What about the days what about sometimes when people don't want to train? They let the jujitsu window close. Which we confirmed is a thing. It is a thing, but that's, you know what I kind of arrived at as well? The days that you actually don't want to train are way more rare than you might think. Like, have you ever said, man, I really don't feel like training. And then you make the drive to the gym, you get to the gym, your training partner show up, you, right when you go to shake hands and you still feel like, oh, I really don't want to train right now. Yeah, I guess Do you that have those? never happens. Never, right? Hardly no. ever. I can't think of one single time. I thought I came to the gym one time and I got there and I was like, I still don't want to train, but it was because there was only like three people there mm. and they were like really brand new at the time. And then I was like, oh, and I just went home one time in wow. my whole in my whole life. But wow. <laughs> I didn't, I legitimately did not feel like training. Anyway. Legitimately. Usually if you don't feel like training, it's not that you don't feel like. That's never happened to me. <laughs> it's not that you don't feel like training. It's you don't feel like getting off the couch, getting into your car, getting your gear, getting, you know, doing that. That's what you don't feel like doing. Oh, you feel like training because when it's time to train, it's good fun mm. every single time. That's what I think. It's a weird aspect that Juju 2 is fun. It's very fun. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. I have a feeling sometimes when I train Jiu-Jitsu where I'm literally like kind of beside myself with how fun that just oh, was. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. And that's sometimes I'm getting beat down and I'm thinking that. Sometimes I'm winning and I'm thinking. But either way, I'm like, oh, that was. Yeah. It's it's kind of like uh, a feeling that's very hard to to 
describe even. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Yeah, because you have that obviously the physical part of it, right? Like yeah, so getting some exercise. Endorphins. Yes, that's always good. You know that, but this is like it's like especially if you roll with like guys who are like good, and they're not good because they're so athletic, even though they might be athletic. Mm-hmm. They're good because they know what to do. Yeah, like a Dean Lister, like Greg McIntyre, these guys who like Greg Train. If you, Greg Train, if you don't think your way into or out of your, the situation you want, man. You're you're just not gonna do it, you know. So it's that problem solving task that's just intertwined in the whole thing. I think that's what makes it fun. That's what I think. Agree. Anyway, gi, no gi, streets, whatever. If you want to do gi, you're gonna need a gi. You get a gi from Origin, OriginMain.com. That's where you can get the very selections on there. The best. Made in America, by the way. Made in America. Yeah. And just got a massive shipment of cotton. And I'm not, I'm talking, not talking woven. I'm talking unwoven little strands of cotton. Is check there out, seeds check still out, in it? Check out the Instagram. There's pallets and pallets that are there. And it's just, you think, okay, this cotton is going to get woven and then turned into geese that I'm going to wear. What does cotton look like when it comes from pallets? Because co- we are just little spools. Of and it's not even it's not just cotton by the way it's it's a blended material oh, it's, so it's a like modern a string yeah strings? like a, okay. like a spool but it's thick a little bit thicker gotcha. and that all gets woven together. We used to grow cotton when I was young in Where? our yard on quiet. Really? Mm-hmm. For what purpose? Just uh, that's just how I guess I don't know. No, I was like little to I do didn't. something with. I don't know. I Random. Don't. It was there. It was a row of cotton trees. So. Cotton is like a, it's like a, almost like a pod that turns inside out like a popcorn almost. Yeah. If I remember correctly. And so that cotton would be balls of cotton. You know, like you get, you know, when you buy cotton balls, right? Yeah. Or uh, I'm sure you always buy cotton balls, but when you buy (laughs) cotton balls, they're in balls. They're kind of like that, but more like a, there's not, they're not in a ball. They're in a big clump. Okay. But there's seeds all in there. You got to pick out the seeds and the seeds are all stuck to the cotton. I, I thought that's how they came. But they're they're twined in or, or yes. spun yeah. into string. All right. Here you so go. we got cotton, we got geese, we got jeans also. I got jeans, by the way. Oh, so you're in the game now. I am totally in the game. And, and I'm surprised how how good okay, good. American denim, sure, the buttons, brass, origin buttons. I was impressed with that when I saw the pictures. When I see them, sure, I'm impressed. But I'm impre- maybe I'm more surprised on top of the impress of how they fit. Next level. I thought they were going to be like the kind, oh, they're just generic fitting worker jeans, which is fine. I, I get it. But that's not really what I was like deep down hoping for. I was hoping for the kind that, you know, I can put on, I can wear to, you know, if I go somewhere special with my wife or something like that. You're putting on those origin jeans. Bro, and you she's can. stoked. They're and good. Stoked. Yes, they're very good. They fit good. Hand it to Pete. Yeah. That stylish fashion dude. He they even fit. a little bit. They fit, even fit skinny knees. <laughs> <laughs> All right, t-shirts, jeans, geese, rash guards, joggers, supplements. Yes. Supplements. Get your joint warfare. Get your krill oil. Get your discipline. Get your discipline. Go. Get these things. They mm-hmm. will. They will. They will make your life better. Oh yeah. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah. They will might make your life better. As will. Mulk. Yes. And some people say, what is mulk? And the answer is very clear. Mulk is. Mulk. Mulk is mulk. Mulk That's right. Mulk Mulk is mulk. You can't just call it some. You can't call. You can't call a knife by some other name. Right. Right. It's a knife. It's a knife. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't call mulk. You can't say mulk is something else. No. Mulk is mulk. Then again, I mean, hey, man, devil's advocate. You can't call a knife a shank. Okay. A blade. Oh, yeah, you're right. Cold steel. You know, yeah. there's a lot of words for a knife. Good in, point. Uh, so there's other words for, for mulk then is what you're saying. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I was, you know, just okay. saying. Well, mulk is mulk. Sure. Multiple yeah, flavors. There is. It is a dessert in the shape of a protein powder that's healthy. Okay. Boom. So you can either call it that or you can call it mulk. Boom, it tastes go. like dessert and yet it's good for you and gives you protein. Strawberry is delicious. Mint chocolate chip. I had a, I'm, I had so much strawberry. I had to go back to mint, and I was like, "Good lord, yeah. <laughs> mint is crazy. Yeah, right. Mint is delicious." I did that. Too. What do you want? Mint chocolate chip ice cream milkshake, or do you want a mint mulk? Oh, I'll take the mint mulk all day long. Oh yeah, 
Short and long-term payoff. Short and long-term payoff. Peanut butter, Reese's Cup. I don't know if you're allowed to say Reese's Cup, but that's basically what oh, it right. is. Yeah, yeah. Peanut butter, Reese's Cup, but it's peanut butter and chocolate. Milk, tasty. Yep. What am I missing? Vanilla. I'm not a vanilla guy. I don't like the vanilla yogurt. I don't like yeah. the vanilla. The vanilla milk is, It's if you like vanilla, you're good. Right. If you don't really like vanilla, you know, don't get it. There's a whole horde of vanilla likers. Yeah, out for there, sure. And the, the thing that's cool about vanilla, I guess, is that you can do other things with it. Yeah. Jason Gardner, put it in your morning coffee. Yeah. Hit it with the, he likes to say, hit it with the blender stick. Sure. Right? right. Yeah, you know how yeah, people, yeah. some people like to say things? <laughs> yes, I do. He's like, I hit it. He gets all fired up too. Mm. I hit it with that blender stick. Mm. He calls it a blender stick. <laughs> sure. So there's Jason Gardner. So, and, and, Jason Garner's in great shape getting after it. Yeah. So maybe it uh, maybe it's a positive thing. And don't forget that there's warrior kid milk. Because do you want to feed your child poison? No. Do you? I do not. No. Okay, cool. Then you get a milk. Yeah. Do you want your kid to, to be miserable when they eat because what you're feeding them tastes disgusting? Let me think. No. Okay, cool. So you can give them milk and yeah. you're being healthy and you're taking care of your kid and you're actually being a good parent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're neglecting your child's welfare. Don't do it. Yeah. Get a milk, strawberry milk, chocolate milk. Get some. <laughs> it's true. My daughter's in this phase, hopefully short, where like she's comparing her body with like other people's body. Oh, yeah. That'll be a short phase. It'll only last like 500 <laughs> years. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, man, it kind of makes you think, like, oh, shoot, she's paying attention now. Is she you looking know? at your guns and like, gonna, eh, oh, yeah. Whatever. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, man. Or is she you, over in the corner doing curls? Yeah, push ups. And actually, she does burp. Like, you know what I tell her? It's, it's kind of a trick. I don't Tell me if you think this is a lie. So, she'll be like, hey, I don't really feel like doing the workout today. Mm-hmm. So, I say, okay, you don't have to do the workout. If and only if you do burpees and push ups, kind of like burpees and push ups are not the yeah, workout, yeah, not really even though that is the workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like 70 burpees and uh, like 40 push ups or something mm-hmm. like that. That's the whole workout. I'm gonna make a six year old do a you know full on Metcon or nothing like that. But hmm. I say you don't have to do the workout, you only have to do the push ups and burpees. She's like, okay, you know, kind of like she escaped yeah, the workout, even yeah. though that is where is that lying? That's mm-hmm. flanking, right? Yeah, it's a flank. Yeah, hell yeah. Nonetheless, You're my good. Point, it's authorized. Good. Yes. Anyway, Approved. my point is that yeah, when she, you know when when you know she's a little girl, being conscious of how her body looks and all this stuff, and being six like, hey, why is it six, man? And I kind of feel this overwhelming responsibility. Like, hey, if she starts like putting on weight that she doesn't like or something like that, it's kind of my fault. Mm-hmm. You know, at this point, it is for sure. So the milk, I, you can I feel real good about it. Mm-hmm. Especially that she likes it, you know, mm-hmm. and that strawberry one is, I don't know how they did that, but <laughs> keep doing it. That's what I know. Anyway, also Jocko White Tea. Yes. Mm-hmm. Can you get addicted to Jocko White Tea? The answer is yes. Yeah. It's like, yes. It's psychological. Though. JP Denell. <laughs> <laughs> JP Denell's my brother. Currently addicted to. I'm not to talking bad Jocko. about him. I'm yeah. saying the boy's got a little bit of an addiction problem with the Jocko right. White Tea. All right. Well, there you go. And I, I mean, I'm sure I haven't thought about it that much, but I'm sure there is some drawbacks to being addicted to Jocko White Tea. I don't know. But from here, I mean, the intuitive thought is that, man, that's all upside addicted to good stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like, hi, a, I'm addicted to Jocko White Tea and I have an 8,000 pound deadlift. How's yeah. it going? Yeah. Probably way more now. Yeah, probably like, not even like 1,200 or something. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Anyway, yeah, Jocko, Jocko White, White tea. tea is available. Cans as well. Uh, tea bags as well. On the store. It's on the store. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Get it. But it's out there. Yeah. For sure. Get your addiction on something good. Also, we have our own store. Speaking of the store, it's called Jocko Store. This is where you can get Discipline Equals Freedom shirts. Like I said, Jocko White Tea is on the store. It's on the store. Tins, refills, all that stuff. Hoodies, lightweight and heavyweight. Hats. Rash guards. Rash guards. Oh, big time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you want to represent the path while you're on the path. I was sporting a rash guard today when I was doing a ring workout. Oh, yeah. Rings. I was using the rings. And if you don't wear 
a rash guard when you're doing rings. If you do high reps, mm. you'll start to chafe your arms a bunch, yeah. which is no big deal. But then you get like, you know, you're, if you're doing jujitsu, then you're starting to get little infection exposures going on. So just gotcha. wear the rash guard. Yeah. Also, you know, if you work at the bank or mm-hmm. somewhere where people sort of have to have, have at least a little bit of trust in you. If mm-hmm. you're rolling around with chafed hands and arms and stuff, they're like, ah, oh, bro, what's up with this guy? You know, they don't know that you're doing rings. I actually trust people like that more. Well, yeah, you, but you're like, you're like one, two levels, like beyond, you know, like in Fight Club when, no. you know, well, this movie Fight Club where like, no, I've there, seen that movie. Yeah. You know, when he's at the restaurant, he sees the guy, the two black guys with broken nose and he trusts them more. He's like, oh, he yeah, gives yeah. them the nod, but a normal person is like, bro, who's this guy with two black guys, broken nose, mm-hmm. chafed arms, all this stuff. Who's this guy? He's mm-hmm. a weirdo. He's doing weirdo stuff. He's doing deviant <laughs> stuff. That's for sure. So you don't want that. You don't want that on the surface is what I'm saying. Even though you like it, so yes. basically what you're saying is get a get a rash guard from the Jocko store so yeah. that you're not weird to other people. Yeah. That's what I just heard. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> just to break it down, correct. simplify what you're, you're saying. You're 100% correct. Also, subscribe to the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I was, uh, my kids, my children. Sure. They were they children. were going off about some social media thing, and they were like, "Smash the like button." <laughs> I laugh because my daughter says the same thing. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a little younger profile, Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is smash the subscribe button. Brad, don't don't say that. Don't try to say that. Okay. Don't. I I just said it. I don't think you should go into that. Well, Well, no, no, wait. It falls right right into the... uh, Share, like, like, and and subscribe. Yeah. If you want. It's it's more you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna embrace that I'm gonna embrace that right now, share like and subscribe share like and subscribe share like and subscribe. So would it what, be shouldn't it be acceptable that I'm like smash the like button? <laughs> yeah, it should. I oh, guess no, God. no, because it's like why wait why I'm not gonna do it just because you said it's it should be more of like a reminder, right? Like, what if I was all motivational? Like you know what you see that like button you gotta smash that thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, hey, don't no worry benefits. about it. We're just kidding. All Whatever. Right. If you want to subscribe to it, subscribe. If Subscription not, is available. We'll say that. Just by clicking the button. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about smashing. If you're going to smash something, smash your next workout. Oh, don't yeah. worry about the like button. Don't worry about the subscribe button. Smash a Metcon. Yeah. How's that? Dang, that was good, Jacko. Fuck, that was actually really good. Anyway, also, yes, uh, Warrior Kid Podcast 2. Let's not forget about Let's that. Let's never forget it. Never forget it. It's hibernating a little bit. Sure. Some people have been commenting now. Yeah. Somebody posted a picture of like someone that was like undead. Sure. Yeah, that's but good. The, the Warrior Kid podcast is by no means dead. It lives on. Yeah. And since I have just wrapped up a major project, I will have some time, hopefully before certain people are not available to record, to record. Yeah. You know? So there'll be some more coming. Yeah, good. Warrior and, Kid podcast. And actually, that kind of is important to note because you know if they're like, "Hey, yeah, it's done," then they won't even it won't be on their mind. No one's even on the lookout for it. Then mm-hmm. it could go unnoticed when it does come back. Nonetheless, it's going to come back. So. It doesn't have to come back. It's there right now. You right. can go listen to an episode. It's not. That's there. All right. Cool. Some people are just discovering that Warrior Kid podcast. Yeah, I dig it. Anyway, we're speaking of Warrior Kids. Aiden is making soap. Mm-hmm. That's right. The goat milk, various other ingredients in America, by the way. IrishOaksRanch.com is where you can get it. Trooper soap and Jocko soap. Wait, does he still have the Trooper soap? Or was that just a yeah, special edition? He has it. Yeah, man. And that's legit. That one's on a rope. But yeah. And what's, what's the slogan? I, I'd say the slogan, but you say it way better than me. Go ahead. The slogan is simply stay clean. There you go. Outstanding. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. And what we would like is for you to smash the. T- <laughs> hey, we got a YouTube channel if you want to watch YouTube videos. If you're not getting inundated with enough YouTube videos, wasting your time watching videos of street fights, watching videos of car crashes, mm. watching videos of acrobatic people climbing around in the city. Oh, the parkour ones? Yeah. You know what's funny is like you're just totally putting yourself on report uh, about all the videos. Yeah, that yeah, you yeah watch. for sure. These yeah. are the things like, oh, you like to watch Street Fight videos. The thing is, YouTube knows what you like to watch, oh, yeah. so it just puts up, you More know, uh, three on one jujitsu involved. I'm like, 
Oh, somebody <laughs> somebody made that video for me. Just right? for you. Yep. So what I'm saying is subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to see the videos that we put out. Otherwise, go watch some more. Drunk Girl Fails? I don't really watch that one. But I will watch yeah, like bad. fast tactical reloads. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so Good. anyways, there you go. Boom. There it is. Yeah. YouTube. Also, Psychological Warfare. If you don't know what that is, it's an album with tracks of Jocko telling you how to get past moments of weakness if they may arise. If they may arise. I went to a, I didn't go to the donut shop. I passed it. There's a bank and there's a donut shop right by where I live. Isn't it weird that donut shops exist? Bro, they don't anymore. That was going to be my point. There was oh. zero people in there. The lady in there, See, the worker. we're winning. You know what? We're winning. We're going to win. I even heard, uh, what do you call it? Krispy Kremes is like either out of business or going out of business. Like at I don't a know. Record rate or something like yeah. this. But man, the lady in the donut shop was um, on her laptop in one of the customer like tables on the seat you know it was she wasn't behind oh, the counter on she it was she was like up, no one's coming cruising. in here yeah no one's coming in here at all I was like dang anyway what should they replace all donut shops with uh, steak houses yeah well yeah i guess there's a lot of steak gyms houses. jiu-jitsu gyms. studios yeah just like a vacant you know what they should do a vacant building they clear out all the donut uh material Mm-hmm. And machines. I don't know how you make donuts, but clear out all that <laughs> stuff, and you just put one like mat space, one mat space. That's it, and a, and a paper and a pencil. You just sign your name. Boom! I came in, use this mat. Me and my partner. Boom! Yeah. Come in, leave. I like but it. I didn't really think it through, but oh. nonetheless, psychological warfare. What I was saying, it's album tracks about Jocko. Can you through your moments? So what I've what the it. report says that that psychological warfare, the album, mm-hmm. has done. Massive damage to the donut industry apparently is what's going on. Yeah, That's what I'm hearing. Yes, big I, time. Evidently, yes. If you don't want the audio version of that, but you want a visual version, you can check out FlipSideCanvas.com, run by my brother Dakota Meyer, and he makes things for you to hang on your wall, high quality things for you to hang on your wall to remind you of what it is that you're doing here. So check it out. And if you have any suggestions, you can hit up Dakota on social media and tell them what you want to see. So there you go. Flipsidecanvas.com. Yep, that's a good one. Also, on it is a good one. On it.com slash jockos where you can get your kettlebells, your battle ropes, various fitness equipment. This is good. You can also get socks, doesn't seem like it, I know. And I've said it before, you get socks. Socks, get socks. socks are a thing, I guess. Well, I, I you know, I'm one of those guys who I kind of like cool socks. I don't buy them all the time, but I don't know. What it's kind not of a nothing. guy likes cool socks? I don't know. It's just, but there's a whole industry out there. Used to be, and for me, it still is. Socks means one thing: what? A pair oh, of white socks. Right. That's what socks means. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, we're, well, you're you, and I don't I have dig it. Darth Vader socks like you do, or whatever. No, I have Darth Vader kettlebells. Okay, but no, no, no. Darth and Vader where'd you socks? get the Darth Vader kettlebells from? On it. Of course, because they got Darth Vader, they got Iron Man, they got some good ones on there. Also, they have like this thing called the elk bar. It's the same thing as a warrior bar, but it's made out of elk, mm-hmm. high in protein, really good, like a um, almost like a big beef jerky stick. It's good. You know, get that. A lot of good stuff on there. Uh, on it.com slash Jocko. If you like something, get something. Also, we got some books. The the books that were written by John Stryker Meyer, the r- books but written by Tilt, you can get those on Amazon. Across the Fence, The Secret War in Vietnam, On the Ground, The Secret War in Vietnam, and Sog Chronicles Volume 1. Check those books out. They're, they're really amazing to read, especially, and when they're, they're the kind of books that when you read them, you have to actually slow down and think about what the hell is actually going on. Man, because so when you think about what's actually going on, you'll realize that the, what these guys were doing was just absolutely, completely insane. So check out those books. Also check out Way the Warrior Kid 3, Where There's a Will. That book is live and ready for you to read or for ready for your kids to read. Also got Way the Warrior Kid 1 and Way the Warrior Kid 2, Mark's Mission. These are good books to get kids on the path. All those little things that you want kids to know but they don't really listen to you because you're their parent. Mm. This is the ultimate flank. And if you listen to J.P. Donnell, he says that these Warrior Kid books are a flank on the parent, too. <laughs> Dang, yeah, it is. They are, 100%. Yeah, as is Mikey and the Dragons, which is 
a book for kids to learn how to overcome fear. So check those out. Then we've got the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual, which will tell you how to get after it. You don't need to ask. You can just get the manual. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Oh, it's true. It is nice. Yes. You get that field manual and you're good to go. If you want the audio version of that, it's on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, and other MP3 platforms. And then, of course, you've got Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership, the two books that I wrote with my brother, Leif Babin, talking about everything that we learned in combat and how you can take those lessons and you can utilize them with your business, with your team, with your life. So check those out. Also, we got Echelon Front. That's my leadership consultancy, and what we do is solve problems through leadership. Every problem that exists in your organization is a leadership problem. So if you need help fixing that leadership problem and thereby fixing the problems that you have inside your organization, go to echelonfront.com. If you need further instruction, if you want something beyond this podcast, if you want to come to the muster, the muster is a leadership training seminar, I guess I'd call it. It's a leadership convention. And what we do is go deep dive, get granular on leadership. The next one is September 19th and 20th in Denver. And then after that, it's December 4th and 5th in Sydney, Australia. Every single, we've done seven. They've all sold out. These are going to sell out too. So if you want to come, go to extremeownership.com and sign up. And if you can't come to that, you can go to efonline.com. And that's our leadership training interactive online platform where you can get the skills. You can reinforce the skills, the skills that I talk about on this podcast, the skills that we wrote about in the books. Those skills need further training all the time. You never master these things. So go to efonline.com and check that out. And then there's, of course, EF Overwatch, where we've been taking proven leaders, tested leaders, from special operations and from combat aviation and putting them into companies in the civilian sector that need leadership. So if you're looking to hire, don't always hire just because someone has experience. Hire for character, hire for leadership capability. And then you teach them the the industry specifics because that's easier than trying to teach someone character or trying to teach someone leadership. EFOverwatch.com if you need leadership. And if you want to converse with us further, then we are on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on that shh, boash. Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink, and John Stryker Meyer is at John Stryker Meyer. And once again, thanks to John Stryker Meyer, 22 years old, putting his life on the line over and over and over again for our freedom. And to those of you in uniform right now, putting your lives on the line for our freedom. Thank you for being there for us. And the same thing goes for our police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers and Border Patrol and Secret Service and all first responders out there. You put your lives on the line to keep us safe and we thank you for it. And to everyone else out there, you might be scared and you might be tired, and you might be surrounded by the enemy who is preparing to attack, but you know what? You're still alive. So get the high ground, set up your perimeter, lock and load your weapons, and go get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.